I grew up in the Arctic. In the town I lived in, as long as it was a clear night, it was an extremely normal occurrence to see all sorts of lights move across the sky. Keep in mind the winter is long in the Arctic, which means longer amount of time being spent under the stars. It's quite beautiful, as long as you don't mind the cold so much. Sometimes I would drive a snowmobile a few kilometers out of town, shut it down and just lay down on the snow, looking up at the majesty of it all. The only thing disturbing the silence being the occasional breeze. The northern lights are also a common occurrence. It doesn't happen every day, but often enough that they start getting ignored after a while, as long as they aren't too spectacular anyway. On one night in particular, without asking my parents, as it was their snowmobile, I decided to go on one of my midnight drives out of town. I drove a few kilometers over the hills to find a spot devoid of light pollution from town, shut off the machine, and settled into a good spot to look up and be retrospective. It wasn't all that interesting of a scene. A few satellites passing here and there, some relatively boring, actively affecting the magnetic field. And that's when I started noting a clicking noise. At first I thought it was the sound of the snow machine cooling down, as the engine expands and contracts a lot in the cold. But the source of the sound definitely wasn't coming from that direction. My next thought was there must be an animal nearby, in which case I needed to get out of there fast. You don't really want to mess with a wild animal, but the clicking is far too regular for an animal to produce it. It was fairly mechanical sounding, and again the source of the sound wasn't coming from anywhere around me, laterally. It was coming from up, so naturally I look up determined to ascertain the origin of this strange noise. I see what I always see. Stars, northern lights, and some lazy satellites floating across the sky, all normal stuff. But before I dismiss it altogether and begin heading home, I noticed something strange in the aurora borealis. There were three rather strong points of light. I ignored them at first, thinking they were oddly symmetrical stars, but this proved false. They were definitely getting brighter. I kept staring with morbid fascination as they grew stronger and stronger, yet still, only remaining single points in the sky. All the while, the clicking noise is getting louder and louder and more pronounced, almost like someone started with tapping a pen on a desk and clacking billiard balls together inside my head. Then it stops, the lights are gone, the clicking is not heard, and aside from being a little stiff, cold and rather petrified, I'm fine. So I jump back on the snowmobile, thinking perhaps I'm going crazy. The machine takes a little longer to start up than usual, and I am beginning to worry. But soon it's running and I'm heading back to my town. As I'm driving back, several plausible scenarios as to what occurred are running through my head. I'm thinking it could have been a helicopter from the mine, or some strange northern light behaviour, etc. Probably not that big of a deal. I pull up to my house, lights are all dark, strange. It wasn't like that when I left. I open the outer doors as quietly as possible, remove my winter gear and enter the inner door. The house is quiet, really quiet. My parents are teachers and are usually up late marking or watching TV. All I'm thinking is I have to get to bed without anyone noticing. Proves to be easy as I'm soon under my covers and go set my alarm for the next day when all of a sudden everything made sense. Engine hard to start, stiff rather chilly, nobody up when I was gone for what felt like a relatively short period of time. It was almost 11pm when I left, and now it was creeping up to 6am. I stood, staring at clicking lights for almost 7 hours. I never ended up sleeping that night, and I don't go on late night snow machine rides anymore. Back in 2005, my husband and I moved into our new home, and we were so happy. It was a three-bedroom attached with a front and back garden, and literally a stone's throw away from my family. It was perfect. Doing the house up was amazing, and I loved putting our stamp on it, making it our home, and hopefully one day having a baby, and completing our perfect family. With both of us working full-time, 
we pretty much kept to ourselves and didn't really know any of our neighbours. But as the months went on, we eventually got to know the lady to the right of us, and we ended up becoming really friendly with her for the next 12 years of our time in that house. She was older, and in the winter we would offer to get her shopping, etc., and would always keep an eye on her. The neighbours to the left, though, were a completely different story. They seemed nice and would always say hi when we saw them, and were a bit older than my husband and I. But boy, did they like to argue. Every Friday night, the music would start around 7pm, and by the time 11pm came around, we would hear them arguing, and it would get louder and louder, and usually stop at around 1am. Saturday night would then come around, and the cycle would start all over again. It didn't bother us, and it didn't really get to the stage where we would call the police. It was just a drunk couple arguing over something trivial, which would be forgotten in the morning, as always, and as loved up the next day whenever we saw them. They didn't even seem embarrassed, but each to their own, I guess. After a while, it came to the stage where we would time when they would start arguing and have bets when they would kick off. This went on for about a year, and that's when everything changed, and the most hellish night of our lives was about to happen. Life went on as normal. The arguing continued, and a year later we were blessed with a beautiful baby boy. We were so excited. My perfect family was now complete, and we couldn't be happier. On beautiful spring night, my husband and I were tired, and decided to get cosy in bed with the baby and watch TV. It was a Sunday night, so we knew there wouldn't be any issues from the neighbours. But we were very wrong. To let you know the layout of our house, our bedroom windows look straight out into our front garden. We can also see our neighbour's garden, all the way down to the bottom of his path, just because the window is situated more to his side. We also have a huge grass verge in front of the row of houses with a small hill on it, which people use to cut through or walk their dogs. Just as I got the baby to sleep, we heard the neighbour coming out of his path and shouting at someone on the grass. Just as I got the baby to sleep, we heard the neighbour coming out into his path and shouting at someone on the grass at the verge. My husband and I both look at each other thinking, this is Sunday, what are they up to now? We turned the TV down and listened to what was happening, but the voices were too quiet to hear. We went back to watching TV, and about five minutes later we heard a scuffle, a thud, and then the sound of someone running. Seconds later, the neighbor's girlfriend came out, and we heard the most blood-curdling scream. We rushed to the window, and there was my neighbor's girlfriend cradling his body, lifeless, in her arms by the path. We were in absolute shock. I started crying. My husband closed the blinds and told me not to look out the window again. The emergency services arrived pretty much straight away, and a forensics team was soon on the scene. The police came to our door and asked if we heard anything, but in all honesty, we knew what they were like, so we didn't pay that much attention till we heard the scream. We eventually found out our neighbour had died of his injuries as soon as the street was cordoned off and police were everywhere. It was later found out he had owed someone money, and when he couldn't pay up, the guy hit him over the head with a brick, killing him instantly. It was the most horrific night of our lives, seeing that poor man laying there like that, and then finding out he was actually dead, was horrible. That girl's scream will live with me forever. Life had to go on. Unfortunately, and eventually, the house went up for sale. Through town gossip, we heard she put the house up for sale as she couldn't cope living in the house her boyfriend died in, and soon new people moved in. The new neighbors were lovely, and like us, they kept to themselves. Our weekend became quiet, but I don't think we'll ever get over what happened to that poor man. Roll on two years. It was a cold and dark winter morning. My husband was leaving early for work and put my son in bed beside me to get cozy. About an hour later, I was waking up from my sleep as I could hear my son giggling. I thought I was still dreaming, but as I came, his giggle got louder. I looked over at him, 
and there he was giggling away, looking over at the bedroom window. I thought, what's he looking at? I couldn't see anything and I thought, is there a breeze moving the blinds? And he's laughing at them moving? Eventually, I asked, what are you laughing at, darling? What he said next made me tremble. The man at the window, as if it was an everyday occurrence. I laugh with nerves. What man? And my son, without missing a beat, replied, the funny man at the window, and continued to giggle. I was frozen with fear. When you watch horror movies as much as I do, your mind works overtime. I didn't know what to do. He kept giggling as if someone was just making funny faces at him or something. After about five minutes of lying there, thinking what the hell, I finally plucked up the courage to pick him up and take him downstairs to the living room. The whole time I was down the stairs, I tried to act normal for my son's sake, but I kept looking up the stairs as if something or someone was going to walk down them. I was petrified. As soon as the sun came up, I ventured back up the stairs, opened all the blinds to let the light in, and both of us got dressed and went out for the day. When my husband got home, I told him all about it, but he thinks that he must just have a wild imagination. Every morning through that winter, I was dreading my husband leaving for work, but nothing like that ever happened again. My son is 15 now. On the odd occasion when I mention it to him, he can't remember. Could it have been my dead neighbor making my son laugh all those years ago? He never had a chance to meet him after all. Perhaps it was his way of saying hello. What do you all think? As a child, my parents always introduced me to everyone that ever came to our house. I was taught to shake my hand with them and say, hi, my name's Anthony, what's yours? This was a rule that could not be broken. One night when I was seven or eight, I had a bad dream about being old. I went out to the living room to talk to my dad who always used to play Legos with me when I had a bad dream. This time when we got the Legos, there was a man in a chair. I went to introduce myself and to my surprise, dad shooed me away, got out my Legos and proceeded to talk to the man instead of play with me. The man and my father talked for some time about things I didn't understand and didn't say a word to me. It was weird, but I was young and the Legos were fun. And eventually I forgot the whole thing and went to bed. Never thought about it again. Fast forward 12 years. I head to bed one night after having a beer with one or two of my friends and immediately start from what I can tell, lucid dreaming. I've never had a lucid dream this vivid since or before. In the dream, I'm sitting in a chair talking to my dad about what I've done with my life. He is happier than usual and very interested. In the distance, I hear a young person calling for him. He gets up, walks out the room, and returns a minute later with a child and a box of Legos. Young me approaches me. My dad shoes the child away. Young me goes to play with Legos, and my dad and I commence talking about the dangers of the butterfly effect and how everything could change if we spoke. He insists we wait until young me falls asleep to continue talking about the future. I have two more similar dreams where I see myself from perspectives of mysterious forgotten people and situations, all with my father, all discussing time travel, my future life, and the consequences of changing things. I woke up absolutely convinced I had time traveled. That, or the ghost of Christmas past, decided he wanted to take an off-season shift. It took me a week to realize it, and still gives me the willies just thinking about it. From the ages of five to 12, I lived in what I believe to be a haunted house. My first experience was when I was probably eight or so. I had woken up just as the sun was about to rise and my bed was directly next to a window. I sat up and peered out of the blinds and saw the glow from the sun starting to rise. I also saw what appeared to be a 40 year old man standing on the curb staring directly into my window. I was startled and quickly pulled up my head away from the blinds and sat there for about 10 seconds before I pulled the blinds slightly to the side to look again. This time the man was about a foot away from my window 
and I screamed in horror and moved away from it. My mother came in, but no one was outside the window when she looked. The man looked slightly older and was wearing reading glasses. His complexion was white and translucent. He looked like a regular man, but the second time I looked, his mouth was gaping wide open, almost as if he had a broken lower jaw. A few years later, I had my second experience. I walked out of my bedroom during the night to get a drink from the kitchen. The lounge room was in the center of the kitchen and was joined to it off the left. On the right side of the lounge room was the front room. I walked down the hall to the entrance of the lounge room. My mother had left the light on during the night so that if any of the kids woke up, they could move around easy. As I got to the entrance of the lounge room, I noticed a figure to the right of me near the front door. A very tall woman was walking towards me. I stood frozen in fear as she walked past me and seemed to reach out and grab something of a cork board in the kitchen. She then turned around and walked straight past me and again through the front door. As she did, she did not take her eyes off me and stared directly at me the whole time. She had the same complexion as the man and I could see clearly the wrinkles on her face. She was very tall, maybe close to seven foot. She had brown hair and a white gown on. I was fixated on her, but out of my peripheral, I could see what looked like a piece of paper, which she took from the cork board. The way she stared at me the whole time still horrifies me 20 years later. Telling the story to my family when I was about 18, a few others had different encounters. My brother saw two dark figures sitting at the dining table, seeming to be peeling potatoes. My sister saw a little boy poke his head out around the doorframe as she sat in the bathtub. We moved out and life went on. In the late 90s, I worked as an au pair, a sort of nanny, for a girl called Amy, who was around 11 at the time. I also did light cleaning around the house and often cooked. The layout of the house was such that the second floor where I slept was half the length of the first floor and ended in a balcony overlooking the living room. A staircase ran down the wall and had no rail to prevent one from falling into the hardwood floor. There were two bedrooms upstairs. The one I lived in was square and had one bed and a window overlooking the horse pastures and two barns. The other room was small and rectangular, with the ceiling coming in on either side. The walls, curtains and bedclothes were white, giving it a look of a room in an old mental asylum. It had two single beds, one against each wall and a window that looked out onto the driveway and garage. Through that window, you could see into the window of the room above the garage, which had been an apartment but was used for storage at that point. There was a woman who would appear at the end of the upstairs hall or at the door or inside the unoccupied room. Only the top half of her body though. Her hair pulled back into a severe bun, wearing a dress that appeared to be Victorian in style. She was always accompanied by feelings of intense anger and malice. Even when she didn't appear, she could sometimes be felt. It wouldn't have been so bad if she didn't push people down the stairs. It happened to me. I felt her whoosh up behind me and then cold hands on my back shoving me forwards, but I managed to turn towards the wall and save myself. Amy and her friends often went down these stairs bumping along on their bottoms. A farmhand came in to use the bathroom one day. They normally went to the one downstairs, but it was occupied, so I told them to go up and use mine. I was sitting at the kitchen table where I could see the stairs. As he came back down, I saw him jolt forward and almost fall. He turned around in surprise and looked behind him. Did she get you? I asked. He never came back to the farm. One day, the owner asked me to help get some things from a storage area next to the room with two beds. There was a small access door in the wall on the left side of the room, as you'd come in the door. When it was opened, the room seemed to get colder. I had to crawl inside since I was more flexible. The 
The room was larger and longer than it seemed like it would be from the outside, and looked as though it had originally been part of the bedroom before a wall had been added to close it off. There was a child's plastic table and a chair set up near the door, with plastic teacups and plates and an old rocking horse. I had to move the rocking horse out of the bedroom to get to the boxes I needed. When I touched the rocking horse, I got a strong image of a girl riding it, with the woman in black watching over her, lips pursed in her everlasting stern expression. When I crawled out with the boxes, I made a comment that Amy must have played in the room when she was little. The owner shook her head. They only had moved into the house a few years ago. The toys had all been there already. We left the rocking horse out in the room since we thought it was pretty and would be nice for decor. At night though, I could hear it. The soft, rhythmic creaking and sliding of the rocking horse slowly working its way across the floor. The next morning, the owner silently took the rocking horse out of the house. The room with two beds was right over her bedroom. Then one day, a previous au pair and her mother were traveling through the area and needed a place to sleep and take a break. The mother, of course, got the room I had been sleeping in and took a change of clothes and my personal belongings into the room with two beds. The other au pair, Mary, had a fair bit in common with me, and we started chatting. Mary said she was relieved I was sleeping in the room with her, since she'd originally had this room when she was working for the family. During that time, she'd heard strange sounds, had the covers pulled off her, the bed shaken, and had seen the woman in black standing at the door staring at her angrily. Around three in the morning, I woke up. When the covers were pulled down, I grabbed them and yanked them back up and they were pulled down again. I hissed at whatever it was to quit. I was settling down to try and sleep again when I felt something in the room through my closed eyes. I opened my eyes and looked over towards the window. I could see the lady in black standing there, looking out through the window. I didn't dare move. I closed my eyes again and hoped she'd go away. I felt her energy depart and when I opened my eyes, she was gone. I couldn't help but wonder what she'd been looking at though. That's when I looked over to the window and looked out. The light over the parking area shone into the window of the room above the garage. I could see the rocking horse, rocking itself slowly across the floor. I went back to bed, but didn't fall asleep. I put the house up for sale a few months later, and it has since been demolished. The area is a sports and recreational area now. This is my dad's story, and he shared it with me when I was about 10 or 11. When he was around 22, he was out of town visiting some friends around 30 miles from where his parents lived. Being the kind of person who was a clean freak, he hated having stubble and a beard of any kind. So he called his parents from his friend's house phone and said he'd be back in around 45 minutes or so and then hung up. Now, he said that the faster route was on a country road that skipped out any major dual carriageways. And after around 20 minutes of driving and around five minutes after getting onto this country road, he said he saw an incredibly bright white light and thought it was a broken down car in a side road. He got out of the car and investigated, but the white light promptly got brighter, then vanished. At this point, he was crapping himself, so he jumped back in his car and concentrated on the road ahead, and finally got home. As he got into the driveway of his parents' house, they ran outside to him crying and hugging him as he was getting out of the car. Being incredibly confused, he asked them what happened. They told him that after he called them, they were waiting for him to get home, but he didn't get home that night. Apparently, it had been three days since his phone call. After calming down and calming his parents down, he went to his bedroom and glanced at himself in the mirror. As he walked past it, he had a freaking stubbly beard on the go. To this very day, no one knows what happened that night, and his family hate talking about it.
I rented a house. And within three months of moving in, some weird stuff began to happen. The first thing you need to know is that the previous owner had passed away in the said house after living their whole life there. So on to the story. I was standing in my kitchen, my friend in the living room talking to me. I was telling him how the TV would turn on and off on its own, as well as doors opening and other strange things that started happening recently. I had a drink mixer station on the top of my fridge in the kitchen. The fridge was flat and level as could be. Right as I told him I was getting a little spooked, the drink mixer flings in the middle of the room and drops in the middle of the kitchen. Every little glass jar of mixer shattered. These are thick little glasses that I could have dropped from a high height on my wood floor and they would have literally been fine. They were flung into the middle of the kitchen and the floor, at least six feet away, and didn't touch the fridge at all. My friend and I just stared at each other, mouths open wide, and immediately we yelled out at the top of our lungs to stop messing with us and that I was going to take good care of their home and to please stop. I never had anything happen again after that, but I do believe there are spirits out there and forces at work that we don't know about. Gives me goosebumps just remembering it. Four or five years ago, I worked at a Little Caesars Pizza. Usually I would work inside on the pizzas, but we had just started up this Monday Madness deal where pizzas were only $4 on Monday, so we needed someone to advertise this great deal. I was a wild and weird metalhead, so I took up the position on Mondays of just going out there, throwing around a sign to get attention, and bring people in for delicious pizza. Not exactly glamorous, but I had fun. One day while I was out there doing my thing, I see a van coming straight at me. It jumps the curb and slams into me and I feel it crush against me and the electrical box controlling the street light. I see a quick flash as the traffic light flicks off and then black out. I gasp and I'm still on the corner and nothing has happened, no van or anything. Well, I was a little shaken, so I decide to pack up and walk back to the store for a break. I walk no more than 15 feet from the corner when I hear a crash. I look back and a van just hopped the curb into the electrical box and I watched the traffic light flick off. Needless to say, I took the day off. Still think about it from time to time? I want to start off by saying I really don't consider myself a heavy believer in the paranormal. I feel that a lot of situations can be explained by logical science. There are some things that simply cannot be explained though. There were three incidences in my childhood home that I cannot still explain to this day. If someone has experienced anything similar, feel free to give me insight. Let me take you back to when I was younger, perhaps 10 or 11. We lived in a very large old Victorian house which had five floors, very long hallways on each floor and old wooden flooring. There were always creepy sounds at night and weird power outages, but that could always be attributed to the age of the house. We liked the house a lot. The first incident happened in the attic. We called it the attic, but in reality, it had a family room, a bathroom, a kitchen, and a guest room. The third floor stairs have a landing that leads to the attic door, which takes you up a flight of stairs, and you come to a long hallway on your left that leads you to the family room at the end of the hall, and a large window on your right that the moonlight comes through. When you enter the family room, there's a spiral staircase that takes you to the top floor, which is just a dark, small room that we never used except for storage. One night, I was playing with my toys on the stairs of the third floor, right next to the door that leads to the attic. We had a cat at the time. As I was playing, I heard scratching in the attic, not wanting to get in trouble for her destroying a couch, as I'm the one who asked for the cat. I opened the attic door and walked up the stairs to go find her. As soon as I reached the top of the stairs and turned down the long hallway, the scratching stopped and the power to the house went out, which left me in total darkness. I put my back against the window and slid down, 
and started down the long hallway, terrified and waiting for the power to come on. As I slid down, I heard a very slow thump, the sound of someone walking down the spiral staircase. The sound is unmistakable because the steps are metal. The sound continued right behind the family room door. I heard each step. The steps stopped. The family room door moved slightly and immediately I felt this rush come over me. I got so cold and my heart started beating in such a way I felt it actually move my chest. After a few seconds, the door bolted open and something started sprinting down the hallway at me. I couldn't see a thing, but I felt the movement, that feeling you get when something is near you. I remember that was the first time I ever felt like prey. My heart was in my throat, but I screamed as loudly as I could, and as soon as it got close to me, the rush went away, and the cold left my body. My parents ran up the stairs, and after I told them what happened, they went to the breaker box and came up and looked all around but found nothing. But the handle on the family room door was broken, and the window behind me was cracked. It is possible I cracked it when I put my back into it to slide down, but it was cracked at a height that I couldn't reach with my body at the time. The basement was the worst part of the house. It was one of those dreary, unfinished concrete floor basements. It was as large as any first floor of a house. I mean truly massive. When you open the door, the short stairs look like you're going into a cellar. And when you come down the stairs, you have to walk for several steps in the dark to find the string of light and pull it. Even then, that light only illuminates the immediate area, not the rest of the basement. There are several lights like this the further you go, each one with a string to pull. To the left is the rest of the basement. It goes all the way back and then there's a cove tucked to the left where the dogs sleep. It's out of the line of sight. Since there's a small window in the cove, it casts this bluish black light in the morning and night from the moon. One early morning around 5 a.m. I had to go feed the dogs since my dad was out of town. I hated when it was my turn because the basement always gave me a terrible feeling. I would always call the dogs to meet me at the stairs so that I didn't have to walk down the stairs in the dark alone. I called for them, waited and called again. They didn't come and I heard no sound, so I walked down the stairs in the dark and held my hand out to find the string to pull the light. As I reached for the light, I saw movement at the end of the basement near the cove, and my breath caught in my chest. I pulled the light fast, and the bulb popped with a quick burst of light. In that moment, I saw a man standing at the end of the basement. He didn't disappear like in the movies, though, and I wish he had. In the dark, he was a sliver of moonlight from the cove window. I can still see him standing there with his back to me. He didn't move at all, and his head was cocked to the left in such an unnatural way, at an angle where his neck had to have been broken. He was probably 40 feet away from me. As I stood there trying to force a scream through my throat that felt like it was locked up, I couldn't look away. And in those few seconds I stared, I saw it. It was left of a man and more of a thing. It had white translucent skin and looked gangly. I literally and honestly pissed myself standing up. I lost all control. I think the pee snapped out of me because I felt the warmth of my leg and I started backing away. And as I backed away, it sprinted to the left towards the cove where the dogs were and I ran up those stairs and I chipped my tooth falling into the stairs, still chipped to this day and I slammed the door shut and locked the latch. I called my mum down, and we called the dogs from the top of the stairs. No response. We went down there, and both dogs were huddled together in the corner of the cove. It took them five minutes to leave the corner and come up. We had to pull them apart and walk them with us holding their collars. The last one is short and simple, and probably the worst experience I had in that house. In that same basement, there's a furnace room to the left of the stairs about 15 feet away from the stairs. 
It's dark and cramped and has all kinds of luggage and extra supplies in it. The day before Thanksgiving, we were preparing for family to arrive. My mother sent me to get the Thanksgiving table decor or whatever it's called. And as I walked down the stairs, I saw the furnace room door was cracked. I stopped dead in my tracks. That door was never left open. We were always told to close it so that the dogs don't go in there. Really, my parents made a huge deal out of it. And I stayed on the stairs and stared at the door. I felt the hair on my neck raise and my fists clench out of instinct. As I stare in the crack of the door, I see half a smile on one eye. The smile was so close to being human, but so far at the same time. I can't explain it. It was as though something had been observing humans to mimic them, but just couldn't get the face right. As I ran up the stairs, I heard the creak of the furnace door opening further, slammed and locked the door. And that was the last time I ever went into the basement. From that point on, my parents never made me go back down there and delegated my basement chores to my siblings. Even though I know that they don't believe me, it was a nice gesture and I was thankful for it. Since we moved, I have never experienced anything abnormal in our house. I'm 26 now and have never had any issues with the paranormal since then. I like to rationalize by telling myself it was fear and my brain playing tricks on me. But part of me deep down knows that it wasn't. My dad's house is definitely what you would think of as haunted. The whole place has since had a nasty vibe, even when you're simply in another room with nobody else there, and it's unbearable on your own. This experience happened to me when I was a teenager, and it was my first one. What I find interesting is that it was just a completely normal night. I hadn't been spooking myself out with movies, games, or stories, I was just chilling out with my dad in the back room. Next to the back room is the front room, in which there is a door in the corner which leads immediately to the staircase. The front room was completely empty at the time. I was just playing on my computer next to my dad when I heard my mom call me from upstairs where she was tucking my toddler sister into bed. I got up from my chair, opened the door into the front room and took a step inside. What happened then is difficult to describe it was like I'd been separated from the rest of the house. I can't remember if the light was on or off, but it was bright enough to get a clear image of what I saw. In the corner, blocking my way to the stairs was a female figure. She was sitting with her arms folded around her knees and her forehead on her knees blocking her face. She looked filthy, with matted dark brown hair and her skin looked mottled. She was wearing one of those light blue hospital gowns with the dashed pattern. I couldn't tell her age. I froze in my step and took in the sight. It was so real. She wasn't at all transparent and made of smoke or anything like that. She was completely solid and the light fell on her as if it would any real person. The worst part was that there was this most evil, malicious, deadly feeling of primal finality emanating from this thing. Her face was hidden but I could tell she was smiling. I knew she was grinning at me like I was a mouse in a trap. I took a few more steps forwards to get a closer look until I felt like that if I took one more step, it would be the end of me. I didn't know how long I stood staring. It felt like forever, but it was probably only a few seconds. Eventually my body and mind started working together again and I sprinted out of the room screaming. My dad was trying to figure out what was wrong, but I was incoherent. I heard my mom stampeding down the stairs and when she came, I started getting angrier at her, thinking she had somehow pranked me. I don't think my brain could handle what I saw, so I began trying to rationalize it in possible ways. I feel like I saw something that I shouldn't have, or that the thing showed itself to me on purpose. Ever since then, I've always felt her presence in the house and general activity increased. As though seeing one thing opened the door to many other experiences. The dogs always stare, bark, growl, and raise their hackles at that exact corner whenever we use the room in the winter. I would like to note 
that I've never hallucinated in waking before or after. I've had sleep paralysis a few times later on, but it was a completely different experience. I wish you could believe it was just a hallucination. I've had people tell me that the story sounds cliche because she was in a hospital gown, but I'm not gonna change what actually happened to make it more original nor believable. This has haunted me for years, and I doubt I'll ever forget it. All the other experiences I've had, including some with witnesses, I really wish I could just forget though, because even now in my mid-twenties, I still feel the fear when I'm alone in the dark. I know there are things out there that science doesn't have a means to explain yet, and I'd imagine that this is one of them. It was the early 2000s. It's 3 a.m. and my house phone starts ringing. The phone was on the other side of the room. I stand up on the bed and start heading for the low dresser to answer it. And my wife gets up to get the phone as well. By this time, it's at the third ring. And I remember thinking, crap, it's going to go to voicemail. The ringing stops. My cell phone starts ringing, and I immediately change gears to, someone really needs to get a hold of me. I grab my phone, and the caller ID is just 0000, lots of them. I answer, hello? And a voice comes through the line, as though it were a distant overseas call, parting through the static and asking, is this Joel? To which I replied, yes, who is this? Immediately, it was as though those words, is this Joel, were being pulled back through the line echoing in reverse. There was static, and the call dropped. Jump forward several years. I'm installing a phone system, and we're joking around that it's so advanced, it could place calls back in time. I punch in my old phone number and call it, realising the number is still active and that my wife may answer. I hang up and call my now years old and retired phone number. Someone answers. I freak out and ask, Is this Joel? The voice on the other end of the line answers, through space and time, Yes, who is this? At that instant, I immediately remember taking that call, and I am struck dumb. I cannot speak without thinking. I reflexively pressed the hang-up button. I'm now freaked out. I look over to my colleague who isn't as freaked out as I am. From his perspective, I called a number and someone had the same number and answered. But he realised that was my voice on the other end of the line. I told him, I got that call. It was five years ago, but I got that call. Then we both freak out. I hit redial and get a message that the number is no longer in service. I call my home back and my wife answers. I tell her I'm testing a phone system, and ask if she had any previous calls. Nope. None. I'm kind of freaking out, but with her on speakerphone I ask her, Hey, do you remember that 3am call we got all those years back? Yeah? Where I asked, Is this Joel and the line went dead? Yeah? I'm just looking at my colleague with my wife still on speaker. Do you remember what year that was? Hmm, it was before we had kids, so it would have had to have been around 2002 time frame. I don't know how to say this, but I'm pretty sure it was me that called. From ages 13 to 16, I lived in a rural house with my mum. She worked late each night, and my brother would go to his girlfriend's house after school, so I would take the bus home, and it would drop me off at my house. I would do chores as soon as I got home so that I could play my video games or make my clay sculptures. I was alone in the house aside from a small dog almost every weekday until around seven. I was washing dishes one afternoon and I heard footsteps coming up from the basement, which was adjacent to the kitchen. There was a signature sound the stairs made because of the plastic tread that was either glued or nailed to them. It was a little creaky, gritty, plastic tapping sound so I don't think it could have been the house settling. The sound grew louder behind me, as if someone was coming up the stairs. The footstep sounds were about to reach the top of the stairs, but I couldn't bring myself to look at the doorway, 
to go to the stairs. I dropped the dish in the sink, grabbed the dog and ran outside and waited in the gravel driveway until my mum came home from work. This wasn't the only thing that happened. We had a makeshift family room in the basement and we would watch movies in the basement and could hear footsteps in my brother's old room, like heavy boots or something walking around upstairs. Could it have been the house settling? But it terrified all of us. I recall one specific occasion where we had a couple of friends over and we rented some movies. When we had guests over, we would gather in the proper living room upstairs next to the kitchen. We were switching between DVDs when we heard a whistling tune coming from the basement. My mother and I both heard it and looked at each other and we asked our guests if they heard it. Our guests heard nothing and I went to investigate because I felt safer with other people in the house. I checked the TV in the basement. It was off. Nothing was out of place, no signs where it could have come from. It could have been the pipes or the water heater, but I never heard it creak or whistle or anything like that before or after. Just as my brother was getting ready to leave for the military, my grandma stayed with us for a week to see him off. She took my brother's room after he left and she kept hearing someone pound on the door in the middle of the night. My mum told me she heard the same pounding on her door as well. I had an attic bedroom, so I never heard it. I called my mum asking her details and she said there were lots of crazy things that happened. She recalled that when my grandma was cooking dinner in the kitchen by herself, a glass was thrown at her and it busted on the wall next to her. My grandma insisted she didn't break the glass and was offended that we thought she broke it somehow. One night not long after, I had a dream that was weird. In the dream, I woke up in my bed because there was something scraping against the window that was right next to my headboard. I got out of bed and looked out the window and saw the tree branch scraping against it. I looked at the tree and there was a glowing face staring back at me. My impression from this was someone was hanging from the tree. Then I woke up again in real life. I told my mum about the dream and we went on with our lives. About a week or so later, I was jumping on our trampoline outside and my mum and her boyfriend were making hot dogs on the grill. Our landlord was mowing the grass and his riding mower got stuck in a dip or hole in the ground on the side of the house outside my window. My mum's boyfriend said to give him a hand getting the mower wrapped because he was an older fella. I helped him out and then I asked him, why is there a hole in the ground right there? He said that that's where a tree used to be, but he had removed it because it kept scraping against the side of the house. My mum heard the conversation and she and I both went kind of pale. The landlord finished up and we all went on about our day. It was spooky. We moved to another town when I was 16 for unrelated reasons. I tried to look at these occurrences with doubt and criticism, but I still can't wrap my head around what was going on in that house all those years later. This is a story that I've never told anybody because, well, even I think I sound a bit crazy just by sharing it. Let me take you back in time. Me and my then girlfriend called Audrey went to see a movie a few years back, Transporter 3. We both smoked at the time and were collectively out of smokes. So on the way to the theater, we go and grab a pack. Because of this, we were a bit late to the movie and never had a chance for a pre-flick cigarette. Anyway, we saw the movie and a guy on our way out called Mike, a friend of ours, came up and asked if we wanted to join him for a smoke. As we walked out the building, Audrey took off the plastic from the pack and tossed the plastic into the trash can. As we stood there talking to Mike, a guy came up to us and asked Audrey for a smoke. She told him we were on our last one. The guy didn't take kindly to that and started shouting about how she's lying and how she's got no right to lie to him. We offered him a sorry dude and walked away. Then things got messy. He grabbed Audrey's wrist and wouldn't let go and started shouting. Now I'm not gonna let someone harm the person I love, 
so I stepped between them and grabbed the arm he was using to hold her. Then, before I knew what was happening, I had horrible pain in my stomach and throat. My coat was getting wet, and Audrey was shouting, Stop! I also heard Mike saying, What the hell? Then I started feeling what I could only describe as exhaustion, and I no longer had the strength to hold my head up. As my head was dropping, I saw the red all over my coat, and the knife the guy was holding. My vision started going black, and the sounds became muffled. As I felt gravity overcome me, I heard a single sound coming from all around me, like it was the only thing that had existed. It was Audrey calling for my name for help, just once. The instant after I heard her, it felt as though the universe began to shake. A mid-range hum took over my ears, and all the black became a flash of blinding light. Then I was inside the movie theatre next to Audrey and Mike apologizing for startling us so badly. We were apparently white as ghosts. He then asked us if we would join him for a smoke, and Audrey quickly declined. We left the theater without saying another word to each other. I decided to break one of my own rules when I asked Audrey for a cigarette when we got to the car. She took them out of her jacket and put the plasticless pack on the dash in front of me. I began shaking when I opened it and saw a single smoke missing. Audrey let out the most fearful scream I've ever heard in my life when we drove past a guy walking through the parking lot. It was him. She insisted she stay the night at my house. When we arrived at my place, we turned on all the lights and just cried in each other's arms. I asked her about it next morning and she confirmed it wasn't all in my head, but that was to the extent we ever talked about it. And I'm sure this experience is what led to the end of our relationship. Things got too intense between us after that. From the time I was born until I was around six years old, my family and I lived in a townhome close to my city's community college. It wasn't particularly old, and as far as my parents knew, the house had no dark past to speak of. There was a good chance the house was built on old farmland, and there was certainly a Native American presence in the area long ago. But the house itself was totally normal. My parents moved into the house in 2001 and hadn't had anything out of the ordinary occur until I was born, sometime around late 2004 to early 2005. This is the first odd experience my family had in the house, as told to me by my mum. My mum was very close friends with her supervisor, Christy. Christy was over to our house quite often, since my mum often consulted her for help with work, and she would usually bring her son over to play with me. On this particular day, it was just her. My mum and Christy were down in the kitchen talking at the table. My dad was upstairs in one of the bedrooms changing my diaper. My mum goes up to use the bathroom, which was just across the hall from the kitchen by the front door, and Christy stays at the table. As my mum is in the bathroom, out of nowhere she hears a woman's voice she doesn't recognise, saying something along the lines of, Hello, handsome. My mum, thinking a neighbour has come over to say hello, thinks nothing of it, and when she comes out of the bathroom, she asks Christy if anyone's come over. Christy looks at my mum baffled, and tells her that no one has entered the house, and that she hadn't heard a woman's voice. As Christy and my mum look around the house puzzled, my dad comes downstairs holding me and asks, Who stopped by to say hello? He'd heard the same woman's voice. No one could figure out where the voice had come from, or how both my mum and dad, on two separate floors at the time, had both heard the same voice. Christy told my mum she got a weird feeling in the house, but my parents just wrote it off and figured it was just a strange coincidence. But this proved to only be the beginning. It was around this time that my mum began capturing these strange balls of light in every picture she took around the house. Now my mum acknowledges herself that capturing a picture or two containing an orb is nothing out of the ordinary, considering orbs can be caused by dust or tricks of the light. But this was different. These orbs were appearing in every picture she would take. 
My mum cut the camera strap off her camera, tried using disposable Kodak cameras instead of our digital one, and got the house deep cleaned several times. Took pictures in different parts of the house to avoid light contamination, and even bought an entirely new digital camera. But alas, the orb still appeared in every single photo. There are hundreds of photos sitting in albums in our living room with these massive orbs in them. These orbs will show up later in the story. My mum hosted a group of mothers for young babies at our house, and Christy also happened to be a part of this group. One day the group was over at the house and seated in a circle in our living room, when suddenly Christy looked up towards our couch and screamed, pointing towards it. She looked at my mum in a panic and shouts, there's a man standing behind your couch. The rest of the group looked over to see no one. It wouldn't have been possible for there to be someone behind the couch anyway. The couch was pushed up against the wall. Christy grabbed her son and ran out of the house. And although she and my mum remained friends, they haven't seen each other in years, but they're still friends on Facebook, Christy refused to enter the house ever again. Christy had seen the pictures containing the orbs since they were actually pictures of me and her son together that showed the orbs floating around us. But seeing this man behind the couch was the last straw. She stuck to her word and never returned to the house for the remainder of our time there. It was around this time that my parents began to feel off in the house, especially when spending time in the basement and in my bedroom. My mum would try as hard as she could to avoid spending too much time in the basement, and both of my parents have told me that they feel like they were being watched as they tucked me into bed some nights. And then one day, the activity presented itself while my dad was at work. For a little backstory, I'm not sure if anyone else has experienced this as a child, but I was absolutely obsessed with these classical music CDs called Baby Einstein. They had these weird puppet creatures that represented different artists and composers, and all of the CDs were narrated by the same woman, whose name escapes me now. Anyway, I was in the living room asleep while my mom was in the kitchen cooking. She was playing one of the Baby Einstein CDs over some speakers that we had, so that I wouldn't wake up and bother her as she cooked. As she was cooking, she starts hearing what sounds like a woman talking over the music. My mom could tell it wasn't the narrator, since this woman sounded a lot younger and was talking during one of the pieces, and the narrator only came on between songs. At first, my mum thought she could have just been overhearing someone talking outside, and although my mum couldn't make out exactly what the woman was saying, she described it to me as if hearing the woman having a conversation. She sounded happy, and my mum could hear the tone of her voice changing as she talked. When my mum looked out the blinds of the kitchen window, she saw no one. Thinking maybe it was coming from elsewhere, she walked out onto the deck looking out into the forest behind my house. Again, there was no one. At this point, the woman had stopped talking, and my mum was beginning to be convinced that she was experiencing something paranormal. After this, the activity around the house came to a head. There was one night my aunt was over with my mum, helping her around the house while my dad was at work. Another quick bit of backstory. My room was very dark, and it was sometimes very hard to hear what was going on up there from downstairs. For this reason, my parents bought a baby monitor to stick in my room, so they would know if I was crying or wasn't sleeping well. This was long before the days of video monitors, so all this monitor had was a cheap microphone and some red lights that showed how loud the noise was. Also in my room, sitting directly across from the crib, was an old rocking chair that my mum had inherited from her grandma. My aunt and my mum had just put me to sleep, and were sitting downstairs when they started hearing a noise over the baby monitor. At first they couldn't quite make it out, but very quickly realised what they were hearing. It was the sound of the rocking chair, creaking back and forth as if someone was sitting on it. The only person that should have been upstairs at the time was myself but I was fast asleep. My aunt and mum were downstairs, and my dad was still at work. The two stood up from their chairs in a panic, but as soon as they stood, the creaking noise suddenly stopped. 
They walked upstairs and into my room and found nothing out of the ordinary. I was still fast asleep, and the rocking chair looked as though it had never been disturbed. They walked back downstairs, and as soon as they sat back down, the creaking started again. This cycle of creaking over the baby monitor, walking upstairs to find everything undisturbed, and then sitting back down and hearing the creak starting again, continued for an hour, and it reached a point where my aunt was convinced we should leave the house and stay in a hotel for the night. Not too long after, my dad came home, and the creaking stopped completely. At this point, my mom was convinced her and my dad's feeling of discomfort surrounding my bedroom were justified, and began looking for ways to solve the problem. Although my dad remained skeptical, my mom was convinced that what was going on in the house was indeed paranormal. And began trying to find ways to reach out to whatever was inhabiting the house with us. At this point, my mum had accumulated hundreds of pictures containing orbs, and wanted to see if she could capture something more compelling in a photo. One day, she decided to take the camera and point it to a random spot in the house. Before snapping the picture, she said out loud, "Can you give me some sort of sign that you're here?" She snapped at the photo. And as she looked down at the screen, she was shocked. Several separate balls of light appear in the center of the screen, up against a wall, but they appeared in a straight horizontal line. She was ecstatic that not only did she capture something more compelling than a norm, but also managed to capture some sort of intelligence from what she was now convinced was a spirit living in our home. She tried asking for more signs, but in the absence of anything else, she began combing through the hundreds of pictures she'd already taken, looking for anything else that could show these were more than just a trick of the eye, or dust particles floating through the air. After a good amount of time searching, she found what she was looking for—a picture of me and Christie's son featuring an orb. But this orb was different. Inside the orb was an outline of what appeared to be. A sort of face. She immediately began searching around the internet for paranormal investigators and contacted a team in the area to see if they would be willing to come and check out the house. The investigators asked her to tell them about the experiences we'd been having in the house, and although they were a little apprehensive, they finally agreed to check things out. Before coming out to investigate, the investigators told her that normally they would not be willing to come and check out a house if all the residents had to show for the ghost were pictures of orbs and personal testimony. But they were convinced by both the sheer amount of pictures that my mum had, and the two very bizarre photos—one featuring the line of orbs and the other featuring the orb with a face. The investigators did come over, albeit slightly skeptical. But immediately began experiencing strange activity. Almost as soon as the investigators walked upstairs into my room, all of their camera batteries died simultaneously. This actually freaked them out. With one of them looking at my dad and saying something like, "Your house is weird, man." These were all new batteries, and they died in five minutes. The same thing happened down in the basement, with batteries dying left and right, affecting all sorts of equipment. Microphones and digital recorders picked up strange, staticky feedback, and their electromagnetic field readers picked up odd spikes, both in my bedroom and in the basement. My parents' suspicions about the house had been confirmed by professionals, and the investigators were convinced there was something off about the house. After reviewing the evidence and doing some deliberating, the investigators told my parents that they wanted to return to the house a second time, this time with more equipment, since they were convinced there was more evidence to be captured. My parents eagerly set up the follow-up and waited. Now this is where the story becomes a little muddy. I do 100% believe my mum, and the fact that my dad, a skeptic, backs her up on a lot of these stories makes it extra compelling to me. But this last part of the story has always left a bad taste in my mouth. My mum has always been a very spiritual person; always believed in angels, certain stones carrying supernatural powers, and the like. She's a therapist and a hypnotist, so I get it. But I guess what I'm trying to say here is to maybe take this final portion of the story with a grain of salt. Yes, it's odd, but I don't want to make assumptions about what was going on, and neither should you. 
I wouldn't be telling this story if I wasn't convinced it was real, but this final portion has always seemed a little odd. So my mum had set up a consultation with a woman claiming to be a psychic medium, well before the paranormal investigators came over to visit the house. The appointment was only a week or so before the investigators were scheduled for their follow-up. Anyway, during the appointment, the woman asked my mum about the strange experiences we'd been having in the house, and the medium told my mum that she'd picked up on the energy of a man in the house. She said he was lonely, and that he'd latched onto my family since he'd never had one of his own. Obviously, that didn't explain the woman's voice we heard in the house, but whatever. Like I said, this whole thing seems a little odd to me. The woman asked my mum if she wanted her to either cleanse the house or leave it be. Knowing the investigators were returning soon, my mum told the woman not to do anything to the house. She wanted to see what could be captured with more advanced equipment. The medium told her she wouldn't, but when my mum returned home afterwards, she noticed the entire house felt different. It felt like a heavy weight had been lifted off the house's atmosphere. She began to suspect that the medium had cleansed the house anyway. Not sure how this is possible, considering the medium never actually visited the house. Maybe someone in the comments can explain how this works. Anyway, and her suspicions were only confirmed when the investigators returned for the second time and captured absolutely nothing. No bizarre EMF readings, no cold spots, no electrical malfunctions, not a thing. After the investigators return, that was it for the specific flurry of activity. It was the second time we had some weird experiences in the house, which I was actually old enough to remember. But in any case, I don't think they're worth mentioning. In conclusion, I'll say I totally believe the things that my parents told me about the house, partly because there were other witnesses to it, and partly because I witnessed some of the stuff myself years later and partially because my dad can't explain what was going on and he was and still is a total skeptic. For him to admit, not only that he couldn't explain some of the experiences, but also that it genuinely creeped him out sometimes, has me really convinced that there was something very strange going on in that house. I know, the whole thing with the psychic medium is odd, but my mum would have no reason to lie about it. She got no attention from local newspaper or TV stations in regard to the activity. The paranormal investigators weren't paying to come over to the house, and my mum has always been apprehensive about sharing the story with others. In fact, this is my first time sharing it. I'm not trying to force anyone to believe it. I'm just saying it how it is. These strange encounters happened back when I was six to eight years old and lived in a small, mostly unheard of town in Maryland. I'm now 17 and live in England. Back then I lived in this town, as did my mum's older sister and my older cousins. And in both of our houses, we had odd encounters. This is the first time I remember something strange happening. The year was 2011, and me and my older cousin Johnny were playing around in his room with the rest of our family down in the kitchen. His room kind of has a strange setup. It is connected to the laundry room and has a door that leads straight to the attic. I can remember me and him teasing my younger sister who wanted to play his recorder but not letting her have it. At this point, my little sister gave up and walked away from us. And that's when me and him decided it would be funny to throw the recorder in the attic. We were both standing side by side in front of the steps with the door open when he threw it as hard as he could up the steps. Me and him were laughing when we paused and saw the recorder had stopped when it reached the attic. It floated for a few seconds, then launched straight towards us at a faster speed than what we threw it up. I immediately jumped out of the doorway and he backed against the wall as it flew to the bottom step and snapped in half. We both looked at each other terrified and ran down to the kitchen to tell our family what happened. Everyone just laughed except for my mother, who is really into the paranormal and has had some experiences in the house herself. The next encounter I can't quite place, but I remember I was very sick and it could have just been a fever dream, but the strange thing is I only ever hallucinated when I was sick in that house and have never had anything happen since, but I'll leave it up to you guys to decide. It's important to state 
that when I was little I had a huge fear of whispering. Don't ask me why, as I can't tell you. I was on my tablet watching Looney Tune episodes. That's when I started to hear a lot of it. I say a lot of whispering because it sounded like at least eight people were whispering my name and other audible things. I got terrified and turned all the lights off for whatever reason and hid under my covers until I fell asleep. This last encounter took place at night during the summer of 2012. I was asleep and started to wake up. As I looked around, I realized it was pitch dark outside aside from the street lights giving some brightness in my room. I looked down and realized I was sitting straight up, cross-legged and my hands were moving making weird symbols. When I looked ahead of me, I saw a little boy sitting on a few storage bins in my room doing the same hand symbols. As soon as I realized what was going on, I passed back out. Those are my stories, and I wish I had some explanations for them. I have always loved the outdoors. I was fortunate enough to be born in the Great Pacific Northwest, the Western Washington Cascades to be exact. My father and I spent much of my early years of life exploring the mountains, fishing and hunting. There are parts of the Cascades I know like the back of my hand. One of those places is called Goblin Creek, up the Index Galima Road off Highway 2. When I was a kid, we would drive up there to do some fishing and shooting, but also to collect a specific type of rock that when cut in half polished would resemble a scenic picture of the view of the mountains from within a cave. I do not recall the true name of the stone, we just called them picture rocks. My father's friend and neighbour owned an art gallery slash mineral shop that used to be a church. If you have ever driven through Startup, on your way up from Sultan to Goldbar on Highway 2. You might remember seeing the robot sculpture outside the shop that my dad built. This is the place that we sold the stone for $2 a pound. It was lucrative revenue for a preteen. The walk from the creek where we harvested these rocks to the dirt road wasn't particularly long, but lengthy enough that you could presumably get lost while en route if one didn't know where to go. In the years we spent at the creek, I had only ever seen two other people out there. One was a game warden that heard the gunshot from our target practicing session and tracked us down to make sure everything was fine. The other is the subject of my curiosity. When I was about 14, I distinctly remember hauling a backpack full of these rocks up from the creek to my dad's truck. Along the way, I ran into a man that looked to be about 30 years old. We both appeared to be surprised, as we would, running into anyone in this rather remote section of the mountains. But as I got closer to this man as he was standing down near the creek and I heading up the road, he seemed to grow increasingly more startled, as if he was seeing a ghost. He didn't say anything as I passed. He just stared at me, seemingly trying to figure out the appropriate words to ask me something. After I passed him, I remember thinking how much this guy looked like he could be in my family. The similarities were striking, and I continued on to the truck, dumped my load of rocks off at the truck and headed back down to the river with my dad. When I arrived, I told him about the encounter and asked him if he had seen this man, to which he replied that he had not. I have remembered this encounter quite vividly since then. Last year, I was visiting my family in Snohomish and decided to visit up Old Goblin Creek for nostalgic purposes. It had been about 15 years since I was last up there. Along the way up, I found out that the Index Galima Road had apparently washed out years before. Luckily I knew of another way up, via Jack Pass. I found the dirt road and parked where my dad used to park and proceeded to walk through the woods down to the creek. Along the way, I saw something that shook me to my core. As I was about halfway through the woods, I was startled to see someone else coming up from the creek. A boy, about 14 years old. He was wearing a backpack that looked to be burdened by heavy weights. And as we got closer, I began to get increasingly confused and shocked, as the boy looked exactly like I did at his age. 
I meant to say something to him as he passed, but could not figure out the right words to express what I was thinking at that moment. He passed me and kept going. I walked a little ways and finally stopped, when it all really hit me. I remember both the encounter from my teenage years and realized I had just lived the other half of that experience. Both the man and the boy were me, roughly 15 years removed. I turned around to catch up to the boy in the thick, western Washington woods. I ran all the way back up the road to where my truck was, to find nothing. There wasn't anyone else there besides the road for him to go down, and I hadn't stood so long as to not be able to catch him up. He was simply gone. Curiosity got the best of me, so I hurried down to the creek half, expecting to find my dad fishing on the bank, 15 years younger, but found no one. I ended up going home, and decided that this experience was too unbelievable to even tell my friends and family. I just wanted to get this out to this wonderful community, to see what others thought, and hopefully know if anyone has had any kind of experience like this as well. My family was helping a family friend find good houses to settle down in. He came from China and was new to the area we lived in, so we attempted to help him find a place. We came across this open house and went inside. The real estate agent knew my mother from previous business partnerships, so he told us to just lock up when we leave. We were walking inside for a while, and there was suddenly an echo upstairs, like those creaking noises you hear when someone steps on a wooden floor that's not well placed. We thought someone was up there, but we were the only five people in the house, and the agent just came from the upstairs before telling us to lock up later. We ignored it at first, until the creaking noise went on for several seconds, and no one wanted to go and check it out. We were all kind of scared, since you had to go upstairs to turn on the lights and literally no one wanted to go up, even as a clump. After we left the house, my mum called the selling agent, and he told her that other people have heard these noises in the house, on the first story, as the second story is where the noises come from. That selling agent later said that there was a recent death by suicide on the second floor, which brought me chills. We never went back to that house or general area. Not sure if ghosts are real, but something was definitely making a noise up there. Maybe the house was just old and people walking inside would make the noise, but it didn't explain how the sound was coming from upstairs when we were all down. Ten years ago, I was returning home from a road trip with two friends. I received a phone call from my parents asking when we would be arriving, and I explained that we were about 25 minutes away. About a minute later, we come around a bend. It was a full moon and we could see the reflection from the lake below us, and other than that, the road was completely empty. Suddenly, everything went completely dark in the car. No lights from the dash or gauges or headlights on the road, and the music also stopped and restarted the beginning of the CD we were listening to. There was now a vehicle pulled over by the police about a quarter of a mile in front of us that hadn't been there one split second before. I assumed I had dozed off for just a moment, as it was late, and I thought it was still quite peculiar though. After about a minute, the driver of the car turned the music all the way down and said, did that just happen to anyone else? The other passengers in the back seat sat forward and abruptly exclaimed, I thought I just fell asleep. We then realized the clock in the car was reading an hour later than it just had a minute before. To keep ourselves from freaking out, we decided that the car had possibly had a momentary electrical failure and reset the clock to an odd time, turned off the dash, lights, headlights and gauges and restarted the CD player. But when we arrived home 25 minutes later, we were an hour late, and I am missing an hour of my life. And to this day, I have no idea how it happened. My girlfriend lives with her grandparents. Her great-grandmother used to live there too, until she passed away in the very room that is now my girlfriend's room. 
In her will, she left many of her antique items, such as her drawers and cabinets. They were very close. A strange thing to mention here is that before she passed away, she told her son, my girlfriend's granddad, who also lives there, that when his time comes, she will take him. In French, it's c'est moi qui viendra te chérir. We live in Quebec. Anyway, for the sake of me telling the story, let's call him Roger. Roger's health had been declining quickly over the past two years. As a non-stop smoker who eats overly salty foods and refuses to go to the hospital even for a checkup, you can understand our slight concern. When I first noticed unusual activity in that house, it was minor things. Door that were left open when they were closed, kitchen drawers that would randomly be opened, the TV would randomly turn on and off, etc. However, as Roger's health deteriorates, the activity in the home is becoming seriously unsettling. For example, one night, her grandparents were going to some camp thing with their friends, so it was just her and I. Her room is in the basement, which is under the living room upstairs. When at about 1 a.m., all we hear and feel is strong footsteps walking around the living room. First of all, the idea of ghosts or anything like that do not cross our mind at the moment. And we were watching Lucifer on TV, so weren't sleeping. And an idea crossed our mind. The only thing you can think of, or at least that we thought, was that there was an intruder in the house. I may be a man and physically fit, but my heart fell to my stomach. I told her to get on the phone and dial 911 while I peeked outside the room and yelled out if someone was there and what they wanted. But I heard nothing and there was no answer. So then I thought, well, we didn't even hear the footsteps recede or leaving the house. Are they literally just standing there? With the police on the phone, we make our trip up. With me in the front, we get to the living room and nothing. No person, no boot marks, no sign of entering from either of the doors, the back door, or any window. Everything remained locked. The police actually ended up coming anyway to make sure. They went around the house, checked the windows, but also saw that there were no signs that anyone could have gone in. We thanked them and they left. My girlfriend is convinced that these experiences have been her great-grandmother, somehow still wandering the house, because of this, she has no fear at all and communicates with her using pendants and witchcraft things, which I don't believe in at all, but I thought were worth mentioning. Whatever the case is, those footsteps were not the footsteps of some frail old woman. They were heavy and menacing. Is she in the wrong? Should she stop communicating with something just because she believes it to be her great-grandmother? Or should I just never step foot into that house again? I personally... I'm feeling more of the latter option. About 10 years ago, my family and I were scheduled to go on vacation to Orlando, Florida. I was in my early to mid twenties at the time. I'm a big Disney nerd and I wanted to go to the parks again since I hadn't been for several years. Everyone was excited and had everything planned out. It was going to be my mom and my dad, my brother and me. And we were going to rent a house in Orlando that was a short drive from Disney. We'd done this before and I didn't think anything about it. However, my mom and I both kept having this nagging doubt about the trip. At the time, both of us chalked it up to being nervous about the long drive or having to leave the dogs with someone. There was this nagging sense of, we shouldn't go. But it was Disney. We felt like we had to push these doubts and uncertainties aside for the sake of what was going to be a great vacation. So the trip happened and a few months later we were in Orlando. Right off the bat, there was something off about the house. The owner contacted us and told us that there had been an issue and that we would have to delay our arrival by a day. Apparently the previous owners needed an extra day because of some unforeseen emergency. When we arrived at the house, the cleaning team was still working on it, and we ended up having to go wait a few hours in downtown Orlando until we could settle in. No big deal. It just meant shopping and planning for where we would eat dinner that night. We eventually moved into the house later that night, and everything seemed okay. 
The sleeping situation was a bit odd, as it was actually designed to accommodate families with several young children. So this basically meant me sleeping in a child's bedroom on one small double bed with Finding Nemo wallpaper, which is fine. It's a good movie. So two nights into the vacation, I had a terrible nightmare. I have nightmares when I'm stressed out, but not like this. It was the worst nightmare I'd ever had. I dreamt that I was running through an abandoned building, a big place like a warehouse, and something was chasing me. I never saw it, but in the dream I knew it was cruel and terrifying. It was like I was afraid to look at it. I ran and ran and I heard its huge footsteps stomping the ground behind me as it got closer. Whatever it was caught me and I woke up screaming. Now this may sound comical, but imagine the terror of this happening at four in the morning. I woke up screaming, jumped out of bed, and ran as fast as I could down the hallway towards the hall. I didn't know where I was gonna go. I was just terrified and desperate to escape from the creature in my dream. Fortunately, my brother was next door and literally caught me before I ran into the wall. The first thought that went through my head, there was something here when we got here. My mom told me later that when I calmed down and caught my breath, I said in a very shaky, panicky voice that there was something here. How could we have known? I never went back to bed and sat up eating Oreos in the living room until everyone else got up and we were on our way to Orlando to do touristy stuff. We hadn't been out of the house for more than two hours when I suddenly became very, very sick. When I say sick, I mean symptoms of severe stomach virus. I was running a high fever, and by the time I got back to the house, it was like I'd been hit by a train, and I'd never been more sick in my life. I laid there in my bedroom surrounded by cartoon fish and my fever burned. This was the worst that I've ever felt, and I began to hallucinate. My parents and brother made the decision to go back out and leave me in bed to recover. And while I was there alone in the house, fever raging, I saw something standing in the corner of the room. It was tall, dark, and robed. I didn't see its face. This is extremely fuzzy because at the time I wrote it off as a hallucination. It didn't speak, but somehow communicated to me that it would take my pain away if it took my hand. I vaguely remember saying no, and while I was feverish, I had another dream that angels were carrying me on my back, and I was told that I would suffer, but someday I would understand. The fever eventually passed, but I would spend the entire week very sick, and I did not see the black figure again or have any more nightmares, and at the time, I believe it had just been the effect of the fever. Long story short, the vacation continued, even though it was a disaster. But it was the long-term effect that have kept my mind on this story for many years. This began a severe downturn in my life that continues to present day. My health and mental state declined, and I spent the next three or four years dealing with a variety of illnesses, and the next 10 years dealing with some of the most severe depression of my life. But it wasn't just me. My entire family has suffered since the trip. Depression, health issues, a financial struggle have been the norm for the decades since Orlando and the house. A lot of unusually bad luck. I cannot say for certain that this is a paranormal event, but the coincidences cannot be ignored either. I do believe, however, that there is something in that house, and I believe it chose to hurt me specifically, and that the darkness of its touch affected my life for many years to come. I can't speculate as to why it would have happened, or how it got to be there. A few weeks ago, my friend's dad told me a pretty bizarre story that scarred me for life. About 15 years ago, my friend's parents, Michael and Julia, were woken up at 1am by a very loud thud that rattled the house. Worried that one of the kids had fallen out of the bunk bed, Michael went downstairs to check on them, but the kids were sound asleep and safe in their beds. Julia told Michael to check the house in case of intruders, and Michael checked the doors and windows before going to take a look outside. After about 10 minutes of investigating, he found nothing unusual and went back inside to go to bed. He found his wife absolutely worried sick, 
and demanded to know where the hell he'd been and what happened. Confused and tired, Michael told her he found nothing and tried to calm her down before she pointed out it was now 4 a.m. and that he had been missing for three hours. She had even gone outside to check on him and he was nowhere to be found and didn't respond to her calling his name. Unable to figure out what happened, they returned to bed and slept until Michael had to get up for work a few hours later. Michael owns a painting business, and a few hours after working on this house, he notices his eyes start to feel itchy, then his eyes start to burn. Then after a few hours, his eyes burned so badly, he was holding his eyelids open to not blink, because it felt like his lids were sandpaper against his eyes. His employees rushed him to hospital, and Michael was treated for second-degree flash burns on his eyes. He was told his burns were the equivalent of staring at welder torches without eye protection for an extended period of time. His eyes were treated, and he was lucky to have his vision fully restored. He is one of the most stand-up guys I know, and the way he told this story gave me the creeps. Dead serious, and no explanation for what happened. His wife was there too, and she was visibly upset when he was telling me that story. I work as a care assistant for elderly individuals in rural areas of England. There is one house that we used to go to that I jokingly called the murder house, because it looked like something you'd see in a movie dealing with mysterious murders. Not the most affectionate name, but it was all in all a jest, and the lady I cared for certainly thought it was funny. She lived in a ten-bedroom farmhouse surrounded by empty barns and cellars. If it was windy, there was a shed in the back garden that would creak, and it wasn't fun to be alone in at night. But the lady was a dream, super nice, loved to banter, and was genuinely so kind. She would tell me stories about her husband, and how he was perfect and lovely, and she missed him so much, as he had died seven years prior from cancer. She had pictures of him all around the house. Other carers that I worked with had noted some experiences at the house. During the daytime, one girl was making the bed and glanced out the window to see a man gardening that didn't look like the usual gardener. She went to our client and explained, Oh, Sarah, you got a new gardener, and proceeded to describe the man she saw. Sarah would smile and say, That's my husband. I bought him that jacket 30 years ago, and he used to wear it for gardening. She seemed to gain comfort from the thought of him being there, which was precious. I had never had an experience at the house until five months of going to see her. I wasn't on shift, but had come in with my co-worker who had her call. So I sat in the chair across from her bed and spoke with her. Behind the chair was nothing but wall, and beside me on the left was a large chest, and to my right a bookcase. As I was speaking, I felt a calming presence over me, and I felt like my co-worker had re-entered the room, and had walked behind my chair and was standing to my right. This was odd, but I turned to include her in the conversation. She wasn't there. Confused, I looked back, and Sarah shrugged, saying I must have just been hearing things. It was weird, and to this day I still get chills thinking about it. When I was in college, I was coming home from work at about midnight. I lived in a super rural area. My car at the time had a large moonroof, all relevant. I pull up to a stop sign about a mile outside my town only corn, fields, and soybeans surrounding me, when out of nowhere this insanely bright light comes up down on top of my car, like so bright I can't see where it's coming from when I look up. We have had Samaritan helicopters that have flown over our house with those bright spotlights looking for a safe place to land when there was a car accident far from town. So I'm looking up and trying to see if I can see the helicopter above me but this light is so bright I can't see a thing. I remember very slowly starting to make the turn for the stop sign towards town when the light took off super fast ahead of me 
expanded, and I can only describe it like something you would see in a space movie, and then disappeared. Next thing I knew, I was crossing the bridge into town, which was about a mile away from where I last remembered being. In the fall of 2016, I moved into half of a really old house that was built in the 1880s, a stone's throw away from the original campus of Indiana University, which is now a park filled with homeless people and drug addicts. The owners basically turned it into a weird duplex. My friend had lived in it right before I moved in and claimed that it was haunted. But I really didn't believe him, because he was a bit of an odd guy. The layout of the house was weird. You walked into the door and were in a living room type of space, and then you kept walking, and there was a doorway to a bedroom. Past that, the kitchen. No doors. The only door inside the apartment was to the bathroom and the one that led to the shared basement. So my first night there was uneventful. I was a little uncomfortable because I hadn't lived by myself in a long time and was just feeling lonely and on edge. I stayed up late and then eventually fell asleep, but I woke up again at around three in the morning. Cliché, I know. What woke me up was what sounded like a group of drummers drumming on every flat surface of the living room. It went on for a while and I was completely terrified. It was just a cacophony of sounds. After about two or three minutes, I finally gathered up the balls to get up and check on it. As soon as I passed the threshold to the living room, it just stopped. Nothing happened the rest of the night, but I didn't get much sleep. A few days later, my friend was visiting and he was about to leave. He was standing by the front door next to my bookshelf and I told him how I was having trouble sleeping and the story from the night before. As I was saying this, a book threw itself off the bookshelf and onto the floor three feet away. It had to fly past the dresser, the shelf it was perched, and landed between the two of us. He just gave me a creeped out look and said he had to go. I don't blame him. Eventually I asked the guy in the other half what was up, as he had lived there for eight years. He told me that no one stayed there longer than a year, and they all reported the same stuff. For whatever reason, he said nothing ever happened on his side. Doesn't make sense, but there it is. On top of that, you would hear stuff shuffling around a lot in the room you were in. The light to the shared basement would randomly come on at night, even when the neighbor was traveling. Sometimes I would feel something get into my bed, like a cat and nothing was ever there. Even after I ended up with a pair of cats, I had a lot, and I mean a lot, of nightmares while there. That was the bulk of it. But I have two stories that were more notable, and here they are. The first one was when I was woken up sometime in the middle of the night to a loud crashing sound. So in the living room, there was an old electric organ with about six inches of clearance from the wall. I stashed a folding chair like you would buy in Ikea in between the organ and the wall. The crashing sound was the folding chair being unfolded and slammed into the middle of the room. By this point I already had the cats and they were just sitting there staring at me when I came into the room. The second, I would admit, may have a conventional explanation, but I find it so much more scary if it were paranormal. I'll let you decide. At some point, I reconnected with an old friend who'd moved home from California when his father got cancer. He ended up living with me, which was not ideal because, as I said earlier, there were no doors, no privacy. But we became close friends. Being poor, we made it work. So he ended up dating this girl who lived about three blocks down the road and would often leave and sleep over there. I got him a job where I worked nine to five and we would alternate driving to work in the morning. Anyway, one night he's over at his girl's house, spending the night, and I went to bed. Sometime in the night he came back home, and he went to use the bathroom, which was in my room. Remember no doors? So he had to walk past my bed to use the toilet. I wake up. He's there, taking a leak, 
and I can see the light on under the door. When he's done and turns off the light, he lays down to sleep on the couch. It's winter, and the cats had been escaping and coming back late at night. And one of them had been outside earlier, so I wonder if he had come in with my roommate. And if not, if he would have seen him coming home and waiting at the door. So I decided to get up and check. I go to the door, open it, but there's no Luke. I close the door, and he is sitting right there by my feet with his sister. Okay, I look at the couch. The room is already fast asleep as usual. All is good and I go back to sleep. In the morning I wake up and my room is gone. I go about my routine and step out to smoke a cigarette while my car warms up. As it gets closer to nine, I begin to debate leaving him to drive himself when I see him coming sprinting down the sidewalk. We get in the car and start for work. I ask him what time he left in the morning to go back to his girlfriend's house. He said he was there all night. I just about crapped my pants. I know for a fact the door was locked because the door had some ancient lock design that locked automatically every time you used it. And I also know for a fact that my cat was outside and in the morning he was back inside. I really don't know what to make of it, but it was really unsettling. And just for fun, a small third story. I said earlier my house was not far from a park that junkies and the homeless frequented. In the summer of 2017 it was late, and I heard a bunch of noises on my porch, so I went to investigate. There were two dudes huddled right by my steps with a flashlight, and I asked them what they were doing. They replied using English words, but not something I would describe as a language, and they started walking towards that park, through my yard, and the whole time one of them was just calling back to me. Hey, it's the dark. Sorry. In college, my then boyfriend and I lived in an old house near campus. The house always kind of gave off a creepy vibe, but nothing ominous. And after living there about a year, I started seeing things from the corner of my eye. Things I couldn't explain, but would convince myself weren't there. One day I was walking through the living room and could have sworn I saw a youngerish guy with long hair wearing jeans and a bandana sitting on my couch. When I looked again, he was gone. Shortly thereafter, the boyfriend's things started to get messed with. He left a stack of magazines on the bed while he went to the shower. When he came back, they were all spread out across the bed. Not like the stack had just fallen over, but arranged in a grid. Another time in the shower, the water turned suddenly cold. He reached down to turn the hot water up, only to find that the hot water was completely off. He began to feel creeped out, but I never got a bad feeling despite the things I'd seen. I joked that we had a ghost, the bandana hippie guy I saw on the couch, and that he had a crush on me. One night, the boyfriend and I were cooking dinner together. He came up behind me at the stove and started kissing my neck. I joked, be careful. Jed, as in, that's what we started to refer to the ghost as. He isn't gonna like you doing that. He laughs and says out loud, Sorry, Jed, you can't have her, she's mine. No sooner had the words left his mouth, there was a huge crash in the next room. We go to living room to inspect and find the glass door to our entertainment center is completely shattered. Pieces of glass were flung all over the room like the glass had been hit with something hard. After that, no more weird things happened. No more creepy feelings. No more odd occurrences. Perhaps we broke poor Jed's heart. Where I live, there's a train that goes from my school to my home. The distance between those stations is about 15 minutes. One day, my friend and I left school together and boarded the train. We were both getting off at the same stop. Let's just say the station at the train is station one, and our home is station five. The distance between each station is about three minutes. We boarded at 3 p.m. and chat. I've taken this train more than a hundred times before, meaning we know how long it takes what our stop looks like, etc. Even the train announcer announces the stations as well. We constantly look outside for scenery to tell us it's our stop, 
and keep checking our watches and the stations we're at. We continue chatting, and then, as usual, we get off the train. We exit, turn right, and take the escalator down, and it's not there. Confused, we give a quick look around and notice we're not at station 5, we're at station 8. No problem, we just sat past it, right? So we checked our watch. 3.15. Both him and I have never been able to deduce what happened. The time needed to reach station 8 would have been at least 10 more minutes. The train itself is automatic, so the distance and time never need to change. We take the opposite train and discuss what happened. We both saw the last station the train announced was station 4, and was at the scenery we saw a million times over passing by a school we always used as our landmark. Up to this day I can't find a reasonable explanation of what happened, and it still creeps me out to this day. My grandma and great-grandma and their dog moved into an old cabin. There were many stories she had about strange things that happened in the house. Sinks turning on in the middle of the night, noises of footsteps in the attic, motion sensor lights at night turning on when my great-grandma was asleep, with the dog in another room. Also, there were crosses carved above many of the doorways. When they moved in, my aunt helped with some painting and covering the crosses in the process. As they covered them, they heard noises coming from another part of the house. The next day, all the crosses were back. Coincidentally, my mum's boss's son just recently moved into the exact same house 15 years later, and she was telling my mum about her son's haunted house before ever being told that my grandma and great-grandma had actually lived there previously. I have worked at this sandwich joint for over a year and a half. We run a tight-knit crew. I'm a good employee, in good standing with the owner and manager, and I am a little bit of a night crew manager myself. The restaurant itself is very slow, as we tend to receive maybe 20 to 30 customers within my entire six to seven hour closing shift. This means that I naturally tend to start conversations with customers. I like to figure out where people work from their day jobs, where they went to college and how they live their lives and all that stuff. You can say I get personal, but hey, people like it when I'm not just some robotic employee. I even met a dude who went to Berkeley Law School and he told me lots about life at school and all that, but that's neither here nor there. I like to talk to people. It gets me through the day and generally people are pretty damn nice about it. I even have a mini little arsenal of conversation progress. Just heading home after a long day's work, huh? Nice, where'd you work? Oh, that sounds cool, did you need a degree for that? Oh nice, where'd you go to college? Did you like it there? Most conversations are extended versions of that, and it usually gets interesting hearing about such diverse backgrounds. Now, about a week or so ago, this man came in. I would say early 30s, dark hair, dark features, sweatpants, a Nike sweatshirt, and a hood up. It was about 9.30ish, and I was ready to close this bad boy up and go home. But I had another half hour to kill, so I said, screw it, let's start a conversation with the guy. Maybe his dad is like a congressman or something cool, or maybe I'll learn something from him. But holy hell, this guy was creepy. He wouldn't meet my direct eye line. He would talk to me by looking between or above my eyes. He kept his hand tucked in the back of his pants waistline. I realize that sentence is a bit hard to visualize, but the best visualization I can give is like when people tack a gun on the back of their pants. It was like he was clutching a gun. He kept his hands there the entire time. He was looking nervous and reluctant, as most people who commit robberies do. And as the sandwich making progressed, I was becoming more and more sure that I was about to be robbed. He asked for a ham sandwich on white bread. The way we lay ham is pretty formulaic, but due to his creepy demeanor, I was admittedly feeling nervous. The eight slices of ham ended up being folded over at different ratios, laid on top of each other sloppily, and did not look like too much of an appetizing sandwich. 
The man asked for Swiss cheese. The formula calls for four slices. So, as I always do, I picked up a stack of the triangularly cut cheese and fan it out in such a way where I can grab four and throw the rest back to the pile. I lay the cheese in a less than ordinary fashion and the sandwich is still clearly missing its picture perfectness that you see on TV. These details may seem irrelevant, but I just want you to know the gist of it. You'll see why. The man asked if I could toast his sandwich. This means I'd have to turn my back to him for a few seconds to throw it in the toaster. I was running a lot of stuff through my mind and I was not prepared to turn my back to him. This caused a sort of mini panic. I grabbed his sandwich and attempted to stand in such a way that I could keep my eye on him with my waist twisted enough to get the sandwich in the toaster, but while still looking at him. As you may have guessed, I dropped it. I dropped the sandwich. I made a basic attempt to catch it as it fell, you know? Kind of like flared my knee up and tried to use my waist as a sort of cushion to hold up my elbow to catch the sandwich, but to no avail. I guess just imagine fumbling with your phone and then the weird motions your body makes in an attempt to catch it, right as you realized you've dropped it. I was panicking hardcore. And before I looked up, I was bracing myself for a very angry, creepy stare. But he is gone. He had left. He vanished. I didn't even hear the squeak of the door, the footsteps, nothing. I ran outside. I looked left, looked right, looked left again, and there were no cars driving anywhere. No cars were even remotely parked close enough for him to be hiding in or behind of. He was just gone. The sandwich was still on the ground, fallen face down. One of the triangles of cheese landed in just the perfect angular contrast with the towels of the floor. Of the eight pieces of ham on the sandwich, six were left betwixt the bread and the floor, while the other two flew off and landed adjacent onto the cabinet on top of which the toaster is located. Fast forward to last night. A man much older than the first comes in. I would say 60s, white hair, dark features, probably about 6'6" was probably the tall, dark and handsome type dude in the 70s or something. Pretty nice man, up until he started ordering a sandwich. I just got chills remembering that last part, because I have no idea how to proceed with the story. It's just so unsettling. He ended up asking for white bread, and I started to carry on my casual conversation. How's your night going? Just getting off work? The man answered with a stern affirmative and offered no other information. Okay, clearly this guy didn't want to talk about anything other than his sandwich. Weird. What kind of sandwich for you, sir? Ham. All right, pretty stern guy, no nonsense. Maybe he's like in the mafia or some shady stuff, and he got nervous when I asked about work. All right, fine. Let me make you your sandwich and you can get out of here. He then reaches behind his waist, in the exact same way the first guy did. I swear to God, the gesture and motion were all the exact same smoothness, timing and form. He kept his left hand there in the exact same way the other man did about a week ago. The same way. Everything started eerily coming back to me now. It was almost like the most jolting deja vu moment I had ever had. And I honestly thought it was just that, deja vu. But wait, there's more. The way I ended up laying the ham looked very similar. The distance between each slice, the way each layer peeled off the stack in ratio to the next, the way the slices fold over. I can honestly swear to you that I was building the same sandwich that I built a week ago. I was having one of those moments where a bunch of stuff just passes through your mind at once, and it actually is kind of surprising how many thoughts you can have in such a short amount of time. But I remember telling myself to just take the risk, and just reach for the Swiss, because I just had the feeling. How did you know I wanted Swiss? I was taken aback, he actually wanted Swiss. How in the world would I pass it off as a lucky guess? Well, exactly, how do you think? Lucky guess, I uttered, as I let a meager, pathetic little chuckle. The man proceeded to say the most spine-chilling thing I'd ever heard. I read stories on Reddit about paranormal and weird stuff happening to a few people. There's actually a very popular Ask Reddit thread about it. And I always read the same variation of the quote, chills down my spine. 
and I have never really experienced that until that night. The man looks at me as if I told him the winning lottery numbers for the next win. Very inquisitive, very, very strong sense of passion in his words when he said this. No, seems like you've done this before. He just called out my deja vu. He just confirmed to me that he was aware of my deja vu. At this point, the phrase the time traveler just made its first entrance into my mind. I looked at him with the most ridiculously awestruck impression. I sat there staring at him for a good five seconds before I laid the cheese. It was a surreal moment. It was like the climax of this confrontation had already happened. But I still needed to lay the cheese and veggies, roll the sandwich up and then ring him up at the register. How much creepier is this gonna get? I just didn't get it. I picked up the cheese in the exact same way I always do, fan out the top four slices and lay them back down. I was looking down at the same sandwich I had built a week prior, and I swear to you, the cheese, the bread, the ham, everything was just so uncannily similar. I credit myself to being a rational dude, so at this point I was just calling it deja vu and trying not to feel disturbed. The man said, just lettuce and mayo, no toast. Hmm, phew, no toast. Thank the good Lord he didn't want it toasted. This deja vu is over and it's all just a coincidence, right? Well, some of you all may not know, but there's a thing called a hot food tax in some places. Therefore, when a sandwich is toasted, there's a button for hot food taxation and it's something like 12 cents. So as a force of habit, I read the order back to the customer in this fashion. All right, sir, so ham sandwich, not toasted with a bag of chips and two cookies. He looked very concerned with why I mentioned it was not toasted. Hmm? Why did you have to specify it's not toasted? He said. Then I explained to him what I said above, all about the hot food tax, blah, blah, force of habit, because if a sandwich is toasted, you repeat the order like, all right, a ham sandwich toasted with crisps and a drink, blah, blah, blah. And after explaining that to him, he was just kind of inquisitive about it. Nothing too weird. I didn't want to keep him any longer. So I took his card, swiped it, and could not wait for him to get out. As he walked out the door, he looked back at me with the creepiest smile you can conceive in your little imaginations. He turned around and says what I honestly did not think I'll ever forget. Just to let you know, I did not toast the sandwich because of the tax. I'm not that cheap. Okay, the guy's trying to lighten the mood, right? Sweet. Yeah, I know he's not cheap. I mean, it's 12 cents but he felt the need to tell me the real reason he didn't get it toasted. I just didn't want you to drop it. And just like that, he was gone. I still have chills everywhere. This was without a doubt the most spine chilling thing I've ever experienced. I explained the whole thing to my father and he came up with the idea that those two men were probably father and son and were just messing with me. Am I making the rest of the details up in my head? Impossible. Do you know why? The man who owns the restaurant I work at owns one other one. Just one other, halfway across town. When Guy Wong came in, I was at a store about eight miles away from the store that Guy Two came in. The realistic chances of those two men knowing each other and tracking me down, finding me across town and messing with me like this is impossible. I and three other employees, the manager of both stores, the morning shift leader and my counterpart, the co-night shift manager, are the only four employees that jump between the two stores. And the chances of this being a planned and methodical prank is absolutely outrageous. I have no idea what I experienced, but if you actually took the time to hear all this, please tell me if this is a legit glitch in the matrix. I was talking to my best friend one day about life and things were really calm and chill. My disclaimer here is that I was decently tired but have never hallucinated nor sleepwalked before or anything. It's still plausible that that was the cause but it felt so different. To continue, randomly in the middle of our conversation, she said that I entered some sort of trance and everything I said sounded like I was repeating it from a script. During this time, I remember opening my eyes 
and saw an oak desk under me with a paper with words and equations all over it. I remember writing with some sort of quill, but it was made of an animal bone, which was quite strange. So as this happens, I'm reading through the scribblings, and then it hit me, a huge wave of excitement and relief, as if I'd discovered something huge on this paper. And then I woke up and told my friend about it. And she suggested that it might be me in a past life or a memory or something. Maybe I was an inventor. I would throw all of that away and not worry about it, if not for what happened next. I smiled at her and began spewing out all kinds of knowledge. She was smart enough to write some of it down. And this is what I was saying to her. Our universe is a shadow of another, meaning that our 3D world is a shadow or projection of a 4D world. I made it clear that it was possible that our universe might be a shadow of a shadow. The speed of light, quantum entanglement, gravity, and other universal laws are all footprints that prove this and will be shown to the world in the next few years. I made it clear that nature would not allow for a natural speed limit in the highest order universe. All human consciousness in every human is actually of a single being in a higher order universe. This means that we are all connected in a very direct way. We do have free will, and I kept repeating this one for some reason and stating that if we did not have free will, the random cosmos would not exist. I don't know what that means. It was such a strange experience because I woke up crying and smiling at her. I explained that I saw my past life and could feel things that he felt, the excitement and whatnot. We talked for a while and she explained everything that I told her and everything she wrote down. So little of it made sense to me. I am completely confused as to where any of that came from and I haven't slept in two days, but I'm extremely happy and excited about all of this. It feels so surreal. As a child at the age of four, my family moved into a newly constructed house in the middle of Tennessee, and this is where my first contact with entities happened. One of the first nights I was there, I will always remember walking into my parents' walk-in closet. As I walked in, I felt a cool and refreshing wind blow over me, and saw an entity that looked like a man made of TV static standing at the doorway to the attic. I felt completely at peace and happy. However, I ended up passing out in the closet and pissing all over my mum's shoes. Later on, as I grew to be about 14, I saw a burnt face and manacled hands floating around my room by the door. I remember thinking that the thing hated me and everything about me, and the intensity of its malevolence made me pass out. The next day, I would walk through the area where the entity appeared and occasionally see it from the corner of my eye. I would routinely see shadows moving out of the corner of my eye, of men in big hats and cats and dogs. One day I saw these shadows, and all of a sudden my sister screamed bloody murder. I ran into their room and saw movement out of my peripherals fleeing. My sister said that a big cat, not our cat, jumped on her and pinned her down. Both my sisters saw it. One day when I was babysitting my sisters, the brand new oven that we had suddenly locked and caught fire within, and it wasn't responding to button inputs or anything. The fire alarm went off and I called my dad to come home, and he turned off the gas under the oven. There was no explanation for the oven incident whatsoever. My friend, who was local, told me that the site of our house had three older houses before that had all burnt down in that one spot. Strange occurrences continued at the house, doors opening and shutting. My sister told me recently that after I'd left for the military, she saw a face out the window while she was reading on her phone. Lightning flash and the silhouette of a ladder falling. Then a mangled face pressed onto the screen of the window. The basement where I moved to as a 16 year old was also a weird environment. I once dreamed that the walls were closing in and ran upstairs in my dreams to wake up on the couch upstairs. My best friend and I, under no influence of drugs, also simultaneously hallucinated that we were at a McDonald's. The basement seems to always amplify hysteria and cause people to act out of character. 
At a party for high school students, we threw a normally mild-mannered kid freaked out for no apparent reason, punched a pregnant classmate, and also I had a scary dream about my grandpa being a giant in my basement laughing at me. The next day, I found out he had died that night. I dreaded visiting my parents at this point because of the house. While they were very kind and loving when I was younger, by my teens they had become abusive narcissists and boundary-crossing maniacs, and quite frankly I was worried about them both. My father, a formerly devout Christian, had been visiting spirit mediums, which I found out through a reliable source. They also refused to admit our house is haunted. And that's simply the house. I also had a crazy Ouija board experience in high school. Me and a group of friends went to the oldest building at school and began playing. I was skeptical about the whole process. And although a few crazy things happened, the thing that really blew my mind is as the session was coming to a close, it spells out, Brandon says hi from hell. As soon as it spelled that out, my friend whipped her hand off the planchette and started crying. Apparently, that was the name of her dead brother. Bear in mind, no one, not a soul, had even known about Brandon's existence before this session. We got to say goodbye. And that was the end of it. After that, strange events started happening to all of us. With everything that I'd seen in my house, and now everything that was about to come, I definitely feel like I was cursed somehow. I even went to a friend's dad's girlfriend's who used incense and tried to bless us. But she says that the evil she sensed was intense. Let me tell you, the next three years I was arrested three times, went to jail twice, was suspended from high school, kicked out of college, almost died in a car accident, and was forced to join the Navy to avoid criminal charges. And although the intensity in my life has died down a lot since then, I often feel followed and watched, and see dead cats out of the corner of my eyes too. I wonder, for real, if I am cursed. We moved into the house in 2001 when I was 11, and my younger sister was 10. When we were kids, we used to wake up late at night and go to each other's rooms to chat, play with toys, and sometimes go downstairs to watch TV or eat directly from the fridge. Her room was in the front part of the house, so during the night the street lights would illuminate her room with an orange light. My room was on the back of the house, and my window faced the backyard which had no lights. So during the night, her room was always lit and mine totally dark. From her room, you could see the door to mine. And since we slept with the doors open, if you looked from her room into mine, you would only see darkness. This is important for later. One night, my sister was laying in bed trying to fall asleep. When suddenly she saw me standing in her doorway She'd never heard my steps, though. It was like one second she wasn't there, and then I suddenly was. She didn't give it much thought, since she assumed I stepped in when she wasn't looking. Hey, she said. I can't sleep. You want to watch some TV downstairs? Allegedly, I said nothing. Did you hear me? You want to watch some TV? She whispered a little louder, trying not to wake our parents. I stood there, with a blank expression on my face without moving an inch. It was then my sister realized that despite all her room having this orange tone because of the street light, I was glowing blue and appeared to glow like the TV. After a few moments of fear, she said, you're not my brother. Then the thing started to move towards her, but not walking, just sliding across the floor like a hologram. She put her pillow over her head and screamed so loud she awoke everyone in the house. When my parents got into her room, she was hysterical and explained to them what happened, but of course they thought it really was me just trying to scare her. I was scolded for it, despite me waking up when I heard the scream just like them. My sister knew I had nothing to do with it, though. Sometimes my sister would see a tall, thin figure, glowing in pink, with a giant turban on his head like the ones Ottomans used to wear in the 16th century. Mind you, we live in South America, so not many Ottomans around here that I know of. 
This entity would come from downstairs at night, turn left and disappear into the darkness of my room. My sister said the thing that scared her the most about the turban guy was how fast he would climb the stairs. In fact, it was so fast that she could never have a good look at his face. There was also one time when my sister was around 13 and was babysitting my twin eight-year-old cousins in our house. My parents weren't supposed to be coming back until past 11 p.m. Around 8 p.m., they were all watching TV in my parents' room. When one of my cousins wanted to have a snack, so he headed downstairs alone. When he was halfway down the stairs, he heard some noises in the kitchen, like someone was moving around dishes and cooking pots. Auntie, he said, thinking my parents came back early. There was no reply. The noises stopped. Then the sound of heavy footsteps getting closer approached. He bolted up the stairs, got back to the room with my sister and my other cousin yelling that there was someone in the house. My sister locked the bedroom door, pushed the bed towards the wall and listened as the footsteps came up the stairs. As if this wasn't disturbing enough on its own, these footsteps didn't sound like this person was wearing boots or shoes. It sounded as if they were coming up barefoot. At this point, my sister and my cousin are all holding each other off, sitting on the floor, terrified, crying and freaking out. They really thought it was the end. They'd heard as this person came closer and closer until it was on the other side of the door, then silence and nothing happened. They never heard the person leaving either, just silence. At the time, we only had one phone in the house and it was downstairs near the kitchen, so there was no way to call the police or anything. And they decided to stay in the room until my parents came back. When they arrived, they found all the kids crying in the room. And after hearing what happened, they searched the whole house for intruders. Of course, none were found. There were no open doors or windows, no forced locks or anything. After that, my cousins never stayed in the house alone until they were much older. This experience marked my sister and she got so scared at the house at night that she started to stay awake all night in her room with the lights on and only slept during the day. She did this from about a year, from when she finished school until she found a job and moved out to her own apartment. I went camping with my buddy when we were 15 or so. We walked down from his family camper to sneak a cigarette in the field at the front of the campground. While standing there, we saw a light in the sky moving, erratically, in all directions really fast, very slow and everything in between. Fascinating. We finished our smoke and headed back to the camper. As we walked up, his mother came racing out to us, absolutely irate, frightened. She said they had been looking for us for three hours. They had checked the field that we were in, and we weren't there. In our minds, we hadn't been gone more than 15 minutes. We lost three hours of our life and never found out how or why, and never got to the bottom of it. My parents' second house had some oddities. In the first year or so after we moved in, all but one event happened to my mother. This one was the first to happen, which my dad also witnessed. That is, if you count hearing something as witnessing it. We had a shop vac purchased atop a freestanding shelf in the laundry room. Now, the laundry room was directly next to my parents' bedroom, in such a way that the washer and dryer were directly on the other side of the wall from their bed. Exactly how we had the washer, dryer and shelves arranged, I don't know. Because shortly after this, we took apart the shelves and stored them somewhere else for unrelated reasons. However, the shop vac was atop it, and the washing machine was somewhere nearby. My mother usually keeps the lid to the washing machine open at night to let it air out. My parents heard this crash one night, as they were falling asleep. It sounded like it was in the laundry room, so they went to check it out. The shop vac had somehow managed to land in the washing machine. Now, it was positioned on the shelf in such a way there was no way for it to be able to fall off, and everything was pretty stable. There was no angle or anything that would cause it to slide off, and I know this because they tested it and tried to place it on the shelf in such a way that it would become unstable, but that never happened. This was the only poltergeist activity to occur. My mother often sleeps in the living room couch. 
The living room of the house is situated in such a way that my bedroom and the spare room are off on one wall, and the doorway to the rest of the house, including the bathroom, is on the other. One night, my mother heard me walking across the living room, presumably to go to the bathroom, except that I wasn't walking across the room, but it sounded like I was going in circles around the rocking chair that's near the entrance to the hallway. My mother called my name, asking what I was doing. She got no answer. She kept calling my name, becoming increasingly frustrated with me because I didn't say anything. Eventually, she turned on the light. Nothing was there. She checked on me, and I was asleep. On another occasion, my mother felt footsteps behind the couch. The couch wasn't up against the wall, and there was a walkable-sized area between the back of the couch and the front window. The thing is, she didn't hear the footsteps. I only felt the weight of some of the pacing back and forth. She said, "Can you stop it? I'm trying to sleep." And the footsteps stopped. My grandma called one day and said, "Did you call me a minute ago?" My mum hadn't. Grandma then continued to explain how she'd just gotten a call from us, and when she answered, no one was on the other end of the line. However, she could hear everything that was happening in the house. My dad was watching TV. My mother was vacuuming the rug, and both of my parents were arguing over something at the same time. She could also hear me playing whatever computer game I was into at the time, probably Warcraft Three. On top of all this, she said she heard a sound that sounded like paper being folded right next to the phone. Now I've delved pretty deep into the creepy, spooky Ask Reddit collection, and I've seen other stories of old phone calls that involve fabric folding noise that's happening in the foreground. The strangest part of this is that it just happened to occur on the exact same day that my mother's aunt died. This next story is the only one to take place within the last few years of my family living there, instead of the first. I had woken up before, though I cannot say how many times, by the voice of a little girl saying, "Hello." I usually thought nothing of it, attributing to the random nonsense generated by my brain while sleeping. The thing is, on the few occasions that it occurred, the voice was the same. None of it was relevant to the dream, and it always woke me up. Then one night, it giggled, sort of like a, hehe, <laughs> two abrupt notes. The second being slightly higher pitched than the first. The kicker is, I wasn't really asleep for that one. I was trying restlessly to fall asleep, but had not gotten to it yet. It's on my bucket list now to see a ghost, but as of yet, I've only ever heard one. This final story takes place on the last week that we would be living in the house, and my mother was cleaning the baseboards in the kitchen, as she always had done many times before. By baseboards, I mean these metal heating vents that rely on propane. While my mum was cleaning, she came across a piece of paper. She figured that it must have been something that recently fell back there, as had happened on occasion. Since the place where we kept business cards and such was right next to this spot, she pulls it out, and it's a picture of the previous owners of the house, with some other relatives of theirs. I think it was their cousins or something. My mum found this odd, considering how she'd cleaned back there for nine years at this point, and only ever found this picture within the last week of living there. She gave it to the previous owners, who were at the time living next door. They, of course, gave her context to the photo, and that there was nothing unusual about it. It was just a picture of them next to some relative. Before you ask, no, the photo had not been taken after we moved in. That perhaps would have convinced me, but the fact that there was nothing spooky about the photo itself leaves me somewhat skeptical. Still, my mother thought it was the spirit's way of saying goodbye. There's actually a bonus story. My mother used to work part time as a substitute lunch monitor at a school that was near where we used to live before moving into the house mentioned prior. She used to commute to the school by walking near the entire length of a massive cemetery. Technically, it was more than one, right next to each other. She would travel from its northeast corner into the school near the southwest one. Anyway, the story is that during one of her commutes. She found the entire ground to be black with crows. They were everywhere, as far as you can see. 
My mum didn't think much of this, as they mostly just hopped out of her way as she walked down the road. What she didn't think about till later was the fact that not a single one of them was making a sound. On a different day, she was walking through the exact same cemetery in early spring when she noticed a young girl in the distance wearing a dress. She found it upsetting that someone would leave their child unattended in a cemetery in clothing very inappropriate for the weather. We later found out from someone who knows the story better that the girl is called Annabelle and that she is commonly seen around crows. In fact, if anyone else is familiar with this particular spirit, I'd like to know more. I've been unable to find anything other than the fact that she occasionally takes rides in the back seat of people's cars. My girlfriend and I had been together for about a year at the time, never had big problems. We are both pretty relaxed people, never had a big fight and never had trust issues, the whole shenanigan. So one day I was out in front of my apartment building smoking a cigarette. This was before we lived together, and I had seen her the night before, had a nice dinner, gone out to a bar, then gone back to my place, after which she took a taxi home. So as I'm standing out in front of my apartment building, she pulls up in a taxi. I wasn't expecting her, and was pleasantly surprised to see her. I put out my cigarette, smiled, and walked up to her, saying something like, Hey, what are you doing here? In a very friendly and happy way. She scours at me, and slaps me across the jaw. Obviously, I'm dumbfounded and at a loss for words, so I kind of just look at her. She never said a thing, just barged past me into the building. I followed her up to my apartment, asking her what was happening the whole way. She goes into my apartment, grabs her bag and some stuff she'd left there, throws a few things at me, breaking a glass or two, and knocking down a bunch of stuff on a shelf. She calls me a pig, says she knows everything, and that I've broken her heart. I'm trying to figure out what's going on, obviously, and she stops on her way out when I touch her sleeve, glares at me again and slaps me, telling me something like, I hope I never see you again, and walks out. I followed her to the street, she got in a cab, and drove off. The street was pretty empty, and this was about maybe 8.30 to 9pm, and I watch her drive off. At this point, I'm at a loss for words, scared, and above all, sad. Then I'm watching the cab drive away, when at that precise moment someone hugs me around my waist from behind. I turn around and it's her, in running clothes. She was wearing heels and a leather jacket before, and I went completely pale. She just goes, hi, in her usual happy-go-lucky tone. Then she notices my look and said, what's wrong? I spun around, no taxi. It had literally driven away five seconds earlier, no way it could have turned in that time, and all the lights were red. I didn't say anything to her. I just ran upstairs. Her bag was gone, things were still broken, and my door was still wide open. So then I told her. We were both monumentally confused. There's no way I could have mixed her up with someone else, and she's an only child. We had security check the cameras, and sure enough, me following a girl to my apartment. The angles weren't great and the film wasn't great quality, but it's pretty easy to see me in my face, but hers was always hard to make out, but it looked a hell of a lot like her, but was never a clear shot. No way it was the same girl. It still creeps me out to this day, and we don't talk about it. We ended up doing a police report. They came up, gathered up all the broken stuff, and found only my fingerprints and my girlfriend's on them. Same with the door. And this girl got into my apartment building herself, which means she knew my door code. A little while after, I had a conversation with a professor at Columbia, who's a family friend, about this situation. Hypothetically, not wanting to sound the fool. He teaches something like philosophy, and other things to do with superstition and explaining the unexplainable. One of his explanations was very close to this. Somehow, a mirror of our world running at nearly identical timeline folds over ours or collides with ours temporarily. Maybe she saw me at the bar the night before with another friend, or girl, not seeing her face and decided to break up with me the next morning coming to my apartment. The amount of disturbance that resulted in caused our two worlds to break apart right as she drove away. 
I'm not really one to believe in those things, but after this, I don't consider anything impossible. Also, that makes me wonder, if it's true, how much did that mess up this mirror world? Things can't possibly be the same there now. She broke up with me. I don't know. It's a lot to think about. My sister and I were just talking on the phone about some strange things that had happened to us all throughout our time in our childhood home. I mentioned that I thought our home was haunted because our mother had taken a rock from Auschwitz and brought it back home. My working theory is that the rock itself carries energy or memory or spirits that are imprinted into the stone because of the horrific trauma within the walls of the concentration camp. My sister and I were sharing stories and experiences that we had, which correlated with the time that the rock had been in our family home, as well as correlated to the movement of the rock from room to room. I am very aware that what my mum did was disrespectful and disturbed some energies. It's just taking a long time to put two and two together about this subject. Anyway, just for reference, we would experience in our house physical pain unrelated to any obvious injury, mental health struggles, and thoughts of ending our own life, unexplainable and unintelligible whispers, shouts, loud bangs, and the like with no discernible cause. Strange sounds coming from underneath the floor in my bedroom, odd lights and anomalies in my sister's bedroom, and just an atmosphere of constant unease and anxiety. Any ideas would be greatly appreciated. We don't know what to go about this, but we definitely want to talk to our mum about having something done to cleanse the house and doing something with the rock that honours the spirits of the innocent dead while banishing any lingering spirits connected to it. Please, all suggestions would be appreciated. Before I was born, my parents decided to move to the coast and open their own little seaside hotel. The first thing to do when they moved is to clean all the rooms so they took half each to speed things up. My mum told me this story when I was little. She was in a certain room cleaning, doing some vacuuming, when the whole carpet started rippling. When I was little, I didn't think it sounded scary at all. I just thought maybe it had been caught on a carpet or something, so never really thought about it again. Fast forward about a month ago, I remembered this old story and made fun of my mum for thinking it was creepy, when it was obviously explainable. She looked confused and told me I must not have understood her when I was little. Apparently what had actually happened was that the entire carpet had rippled in a constant fluid wave motion and that all the furniture and herself had been lifted up and down off the ground for about 10 seconds. She then screamed bloody murder at my dad down the hallway and told him they were selling the place before it had even opened. He managed to convince her otherwise, but she had never since gone back to that room. It scares me because my mum doesn't believe in the supernatural or anything like that and doesn't have another creepy story at all. Just this one that she doesn't like to talk about. Back in 1987, I was sitting in class and had to this day the most intense and vivid daydream I'd ever experienced. I was sitting in class looking at the clock when the next thing I know I'm walking through the mall with a woman who I've never met before. I was an adult and I knew she was my girlfriend. As we were walking and talking some guys started shooting people randomly. Before I had the chance to react I felt something like a punch to my chest. When I looked down, I was standing over my own body with a pool of blood spreading around it. I watched the chaos of the scene unfold in real time. My girlfriend was over my body screaming and I was trying to comfort her. I watched the police neutralize the shooter. Then the other emergency workers cleared the scene. I watched them remove my body. I tried to follow, but I was unable to leave the mall. I lived slash haunted the mall for a few years. As a spirit, I was bored, so I would mess with the security guards during the night shift. During the business hours, I would try to interact with the customers. Every now and then, I would get someone to nod hello or walk around me so we wouldn't collide. I remember an elderly man sitting on one of the resting benches have a heart attack. As he was standing over his body, I walked over to comfort him. 
I had an overwhelming feeling that it wasn't his time to die, and told him so. He climbed and sank back into his body as the emergency workers were resuscitating him. One day I was sitting on one of the resting benches as a young boy around the age of six or seven sat down next to me. He started talking to me, and when he did, I felt something weird happen, and I knew I was about to leave with him. I became his invisible friend. His name was Brian, and was the only child of a single mother. She was an abusive alcoholic. I helped him survive life. I taught him not to talk about me, so that they wouldn't think he was crazy. I experienced being with Brian for years. When he was about 10 years old, his mother came home drunk. She went into a drunken tirade and hit Brian. I lost my temper and was able to slam her into the wall. She never hit him again after that. I watched him grow into a teenager and when he was 18, I knew that my time with him had come to an end. We said our goodbyes and just like that, the daydream was over. I looked at the clock and maybe a minute had passed. I had experienced just short of two decades of existence as a ghost in a minute of time. Thanksgiving is about a month after my birthday. When I was two, my brother Patrick was about five months old. My father Pat and mother Sally were invited to have Thanksgiving with friends a young couple, Alisanne and Frank Nudler. As the Nudlers were young and had yet to start a family, they didn't have much money. They had recently rented an old Victorian house just outside of town, an hour or two from Wichita, Kansas. They had rented it for a much lower price than it should have been on the market, so they felt very lucky to have gotten such a large house at that price. They had not been living there for more than a month. As the house was large and somewhat drafty, Alice Ann and Frank had decided to live downstairs, using only the kitchen, living room, parlor, and old servant's bedroom off the kitchen. They spent most of their time in the kitchen to stay warm, but had set up the dining room and parlor to accommodate their guests for Thanksgiving. When Pat and Sally arrived, they both commented on how gothic and large this old house was. It seemed strange for their young friends to be living there but they shrugged it off and headed to the door. They were warmly greeted by their good friends and immediately began to socialize and settle in for the evening of festivity. It had begun to snow, so a cheery fire was put on in the parlor. After a bit, my brother and I were put down for a nap in the small servant's room off the kitchen. Pat and Alisanne had drifted off into the parlor and were sitting and talking while Frank and Sally were in the kitchen doing minor preparations for their dinner. They were all having a lovely time, flirting and talking as young couples do. When Pat thought he saw someone out of the corner of his eye walk across the living room just outside the parlor, he casually asked Alice Ann if there was anyone else who had been invited to dinner. Alice Ann looked a bit confused and said, no, why do you ask? He replied that he thought he just saw a man in the living room. Alice Ann was quiet for a moment and looked perturbed, but murmured, no, no one else. As the afternoon wore on, the snow became quite heavy and Alice Ann suggested that Pat and Sally stay the night to avoid driving home through a snowstorm. They had five bedrooms upstairs after all, so there was plenty of room. The house was partially furnished and all the rooms had beds, so they agreed it would probably be best to stay and leave in the morning, they thought. After dinner, Alice Ann handed Pat a set of old skeleton keys and told him the room upstairs were always kept locked. She suggested that they go up and select a room for his small but growing family. Pat thought it was a bit odd that the doors were locked, but thought probably the landlord had stipulated this for rental agreement purposes. So shrugging his shoulders, he climbed the stairs to the second floor. The stairs ended in a small landing, and as you turned to face a narrow, long and dark hallway with two bedrooms on each side or other end, the first thing he noticed was the abrupt drop in temperature as he ascended. He didn't think too much about it, as it was snowing, after all, and there was no heat or fires lit upstairs. 
It did seem to be extraordinarily cold, though. He shivered and moved down the hall and began to open the doors upstairs. He thought that he would open each room and allow his beautiful wife Sally to pick the room she wanted. He intended to leave the doors open to allow some heat to penetrate before having her come up to select the room. As he moved around, he felt an odd prickling feeling, as though he were being watched. He shrugged it off and laughed to himself quietly. As he thought, he was just scaring himself. As he opened the last door, he headed for the stairs and had just stepped down a stair or two when behind him he heard a slow creak, followed by the sound of a door closing with a click. He slowly turned to see the first door closed and the second door creaking closed with another click, followed by the third and the fourth and the fifth. He stood there for a moment trying to rationalize what he had just seen and heard. He decided there must be a draft or the house being old might be causing the doors to close. So back up he went to reopen the doors, only to find that they were all locked again. Feeling somewhat bewildered, he rationalized, thinking it must be something to do with the age of the house and how the doors worked. He began unlocking them all over again, opening them and moving them back and forth to see how they would close on their own. But they seemed perfectly fine. Shrugging his shoulders, he finished opening them and again began to descend the stairs only to hear another creak and slam. This time, the doors were closing with a bit more force, much harder and louder. He froze on the stairs and watched the remaining doors creak closed with a slam one by one. At this point, he decided it would be best to come back with Sally to pick a room. He felt discomfort and a bit unsure to why this was happening but decided to say nothing. Well, what could he even say? He didn't want to sound silly, nor did he want to scare his wife. When it was time to retire to bed, Pat gathered his sleepy children and his wife and headed up the stairs with some misgivings, but didn't say a thing. He unlocked and opened several doors, and Sally chose the room closest to the stairs. After closing and locking the other rooms, they made their way in to dress for bed. Pat prepared the pallet on the floor next to his side of the bed for two-year-old me and my brother Patrick. Patrick was nestled in his bassinet on Sally's side, and after bundling everyone in and making sure we were all warm and as comfortable as possible under the circumstances, the lamp on the side of the bed was turned off and they all drifted off to sleep. Sometime later, around 3 a.m., Pat awoke to hear a toddler giggling and the pitter-patter of tiny feet running around the room. Assuming it was little me, he said quietly but firmly, so as not to wake the wife or boy, Maeve Lynn, get back to bed. It was then that he noticed how very cold the room was. It seemed an otherworldly kind of cold, a stilling chill that penetrated your very soul. The sound continued, and he repeated, Maeve Lynn, get to bed. But hearing no answer, but another quiet giggle and more footfalls, he rose his eyebrow and exasperatedly flicked on the lamp at the side of the bed. That was when he was met with utter shock, because I was there quietly sleeping next to him snuggled in my blankets. Sally Grogley asked what was happening. Pat, feeling stunned and confused as well as shaken, quietly shook his head and told her that he was just checking on me to make sure I was covered okay. Sally immediately rolled over and was sleeping peacefully, almost before he finished his sentence. Pat turned off the lamp and lay there, puzzled, wondering what the hell he just heard. After dwelling on it for a few more minutes, he drifted off and nothing else happened for the rest of the night. In the morning, he woke up as the first bit of light crept into the room. He lay there thinking and wondering what had happened in that night. Finally, he shrugged it off as he could not find a rational explanation. However, when he arose from bed, he froze, for there on the dusty old wooden floor were tiny footprints all over the room. They weren't mine, as he had carried me in, already sleeping, and tucked me away into my pallet the night before. Some weeks later, the Nuddlers moved out. They told Pat and Sally the house was too creepy and cold, but later they admitted that she had heard them too. She'd seen the man in the living room, 
and they had heard strange sounds and cries and screams coming from the rooms above them. It turns out that at the beginning of the 20th century, a family living there, a man and his wife and small children, had all been murdered by an axe in that house. Or so my father tells us. When I researched the murders in the early 20th century in Kansas, I came across a murder that occurred in Atkinson, in which a small family had been murdered and discovered by a family the following evening. However, the house was not Victorian and was far smaller than the house my father described. Although he was prone to embellishing his stories, which he did quite well, and to the delight of his listeners, because it always made the story that much better. Growing up, my sister and I were good friends with our neighbor Matt, who had a dog, Molly. Molly ran away one day, so the three of us set out into the nature preserve behind our home to look for her. Matt's brother Chris set out separately. In the preserve is an old dam slash mill from the 1700s that's rumored to be haunted. When we got to the mill, we saw Chris and the dog on the other side of the river, maybe 30 yards away. Matt, I got her, I'm bringing her home. Chris yelled, but something didn't feel right, and the three of us gave each other that look. We headed home knowing Chris would be a bit behind us, since he'd have to go a mile or two out of his way to cross the bridge. When we got home, there was Matt's mum and the dog. She was under the porch the whole time, she said, and a little while later Chris showed up, having never gone into that part of the woods at all. When I still lived with my parents, I experienced some weird things. My room was in the basement and I remember a couple of times that I heard footsteps upstairs. But when I went to investigate, I found myself home alone. I remember one night when I heard someone come down the stairs. A few moments later, there was a door opening somewhere. I called out but received no answer. And I asked my parents about it the following morning, but they had all been fast asleep upstairs the entire night. I've also heard faint and short whispers at times, but I usually just dismissed it as random noise emitted by an old wooden house. The thing that freaked me out the most, however, was that one time I saw a shadow in the middle of a corridor, not up against a wall. I've caught glimpses of shadows and movement from the corner of my eye at times, but I usually dismiss it as some hair that got stuck in the corner of my eye or me just being tired in general. This one time, however, I was walking down the hallway towards the bathroom where there was a shadow that flashed and then disappeared right in the middle of the hallway, just a couple of feet away from me. It was gone in less than a second, but it had not been in the corner of my eye. It had been in the center of the hallway and the center of my field of vision. It was over so fast, but it was definitely the shadow of a person wearing a long dress. I moved out of the house almost two years ago and haven't had anything remotely similar occur to me since. When I was in high school, I had a habit of taking power naps while everyone was having lunch. I'd curl up in a quiet part of the hallway, put my jacket over my face, and sleep for maybe 15 minutes. This one time I was startled out of sleep by a passing crowd of fellow students. Everyone was in a rush to make it in before our strict teacher would start taking notes of absences. I ran after the crowd, walked up the stairs straight into the right classroom, and sat at the only desk that was left for me. The teacher told us to open our books. Then the world froze, and suddenly the situation sort of reset. I was back in the hallway, blinking sleep out of my eyes, because I'd been awoken by passing students. I thought it was a funny coincidence, some sort of brain fart. I went upstairs after the others and sat at the same empty desk. The teacher told us to open our books and again, reset. The same two or so minutes, woke up to a noise, go upstairs after the others, sit at the same desk. Teacher tells the class to open the books, replayed again. For the first few loops, while it was still more interesting than terrifying, I had so many questions. Was I having an intense nightmare, going insane or something? I was and am an atheist, with zero belief in anything paranormal, so no options other than, this isn't real, 
didn't cross my mind. Some loops later, I started doing all these things I'd read about online to see if it was a dream. You know, reading signs, trying to put my hand through a wall while looking away, that kind of stuff. Everything seemed as real as reality to me. My theory and contemplation got more outlandish though. If there was some sort of complex temporal situation going on, the loop would continue indefinitely. Would that mean I'd eventually die of hunger? At the same time, I tried to mess around with the loop itself to see if something would happen, deviating from the route, but nothing happened. I tried staying in the hallway or going outside, but after about two or so minutes, I was always back in the hallway regardless of my actions. I tried to engage other students and teachers, but everyone seemed preoccupied with their own tasks. If I managed to get someone to talk to me, they were always irritated with whatever I did to deviate them from the loop. You shouldn't skip class or the teachers are going to be mad if we're late. I get the same default responses and same tones over and over. I even tried to injure myself with scissors, an incredibly ill-advised move, I know, but at this stage I was basically out of my mind with fear. Luckily, it only resulted with the loop ending faster. I honestly didn't know how many repeats of the loop I experienced because as soon as I stopped counting as I was getting more and more scared, I stopped wondering about the inexplicable hows and whys. As far as I could tell, the situation could not be explained, at least not by me, and I was the only variable in the loop. So I became obsessed with the idea that perhaps a certain behavior was required or expected of me. I had seen the time loop trope in fiction before, but in those scenarios there was usually some sort of event that had to either be prevented or instigated. In my case, there was nothing. My self-imposed goal became to stop acting like I was aware of the loop, so I tried to replicate my behavior from the first loop down to the finest detail to my best recollection, but that changed nothing. But I latched onto the idea of perfecting this routine because I had nothing else. Loop after loop of the same thing, they all blurred together in my memory. When you're scared of a fate potentially worse than death, it's incredibly easy to stop asking questions and just function on autopilot. The thing is, I'd have written the whole thing off as a dream, if not for the very last loop. By then I'd completely accepted my fate of living in some sort of limbo where the loop no longer reset. My teacher told the class to open our books, and when I usually would have woken up in the hallway again, the world hung, I guess. I don't know how else to describe it. Time seemed to pause for less than a second, just like you might experience in a game when you quick save, and then the teacher went on with the lesson of the day, and life resumed. I don't know what to do with this experience, other than share it on the internet, in the hope that someone is amused for a few minutes, or perhaps if they've got answers to what the hell happened that day. I used to live in a heritage house in the Philippines growing up. Heritage houses, for those unaware, are like really, really old and still function in houses, most from the 17 to early 1900s. While most have been converted into museums, my family had lived in one for generations. Now this house had seen two world wars and was once used as a makeshift hospital to treat wounded soldiers during these wars so I don't really know where to start. On some nights you could distinctly smell gunpowder and rusting iron, as well as burning tires around the house, but the smell would disappear as soon as you leave the front door. On other nights, you'd get the occasional footsteps or random windows opening or closing with no explanation whatsoever. But the strangest and the most real experience for me was when I had some of my friends over we just entered high school, which now is the equivalent of middle school first year, and we were telling each other jokes around the living room. When I kid you not, we hear a basketball dribbling from inside the house. I've now grown used to unexplained noises, but my friends decide to investigate. Lo and behold, we see a basketball roll by the dining room into the kitchen. Then we heard it dribbling again, I itself. One of my friends who investigated said he legit saw it bounce up and down. So they got really scared and went home. I followed him because peer pressure. And after that, they refused to hang out at my place. 
I told this story to my mum, and the next thing I know, there's a shaman in my house spreading salt all over the dining room floor. December 2018. I was alone at home at one of my exes, and she was out of town at work. One night I woke up to the sound of rumbling and keys opening the door. I get up and run towards the hallway that overlooks the stairs and front door. When I see the handrail, I immediately notice the handrail of the stairs is decorated with lights and a poinsettia reef spiraling down the rail. I was incredibly confused as I had never decorated it. Then a second later, a man walks in the door. I still remember his face so well. He was tall, maybe six foot, military haircut. I think it's worth noting that we live in a military base. Basically, everyone who lived in housing was active military. He was light skinned, he looked mixed, thin, but in shape, and he looked like a runner. While I'm watching this man walk into my house, take his jacket off and put it to one side, on top of this small bench. All of this is happening so fast it felt eternal. As I'm watching him do this, I say out loud, what the hell? And he looks up to where I'm standing and he's just as surprised to see me and then he goes, oh crap. Then I run back to my room and hop back in bed. It's only then that I wake up again and immediately run towards the hall. But this time there's no poinsettia reefs and lights on the handrails and there's no man coming in the door. It's as if I had crossed into an alternate reality for a minute. Perhaps in a parallel reality, that man lived in the house and I somehow glitched and came across into his universe and saw him. He's probably still talking about that incident to his buddies, like I talk about it to mine. It was really bizarre. I lived in a haunted house. Let me elaborate. The house was in Milford, Connecticut. We moved from Connecticut the August before I was in first grade, and two there from Oregon when I was about two or three. All my first memories are in that house. I have an older sister and brother, my brother being 10 years older and my sister five years older. My brother was in high school at the time and my sister elementary. The layout of the house wasn't too odd. You open the front door to a large living room and to the right, there are stairs to the second level, also a closet along the wall on the left. You walk through the living room and on the left is a large fireplace with one full length mirror and on the right side facing the fireplace. Next to the fireplace was the hallway that went to my room at the end of the hall. A bathroom on the right side, a basement door on the left and my parents' door last. Going in the basement, it has the floor space of the main floor. So it was rather large comparatively. Walking down the stairs to the left was the laundry equipment. Plenty of room for storage, but was never used. On the right side was a TV, coffee table, couch, you know, the usual stuff. Because I was little, I doubted every memory I ever had of that place. I never once trusted myself. But now that I've seen some relatively strange paranormal stuff elsewhere, I've had my numbers read, tarot cards done, palms read, all that touristy fun stuff. They say I'm supposed to have some kind of connection to the other side. I'll let you make your evaluation on that, jokes aside. Anyhow, I was talking to my brother about a month ago. I was looking up the house on Google Maps and wanted the address. He calls me immediately. I know something's gonna go down because I've talked to him on the phone maybe three times in 25 years. We're close, but would rather not talk on the phone. The first thing he asks me is what I remember about the house. My brother is a cop. So between that and our upbringing, every question is looking for an answer. Every question is loaded with all this extra stuff and implications. It's never just a simple question. So I tell him all the crazy stuff I remember. And it turns out he remembers some of it too. What kind of little kid makes the effort to put sand on the inside of windowsills? The kind that's curious if the people inside the house at night are breaking in. What kind of kid lays ropes, strings, and all kinds of stuff all over the house that would look like laser grid patterns to monsters? The kind 
that has seen them and is afraid. What eight to 11 year old girl won't go to sleep in her room at night and will sleep on the floor of their brother's room? The kind of girl that's forced to sleep there because they're scared out of their wits. Let's get to the stories. There was an occasion where I was taken out of my top bunk and placed gently on the floor with both beds made when I awoke. I remember a bright light from outside my room light up my room and somehow one of the lights seemed to move me. My dolls would also eventually start moving. A family friend who died of breast cancer about nine months after I was born had made the effort to find a Cabbage Patch doll that looked exactly like I did. I didn't have any friends. My parents were mostly checked out, so I was alone. I loved that doll with all my heart. It made me feel stupidly crap that I couldn't give my doll life. I thought I wasn't loving him enough, but I knew I was loving him with all I had. Later in life, I realized all those moments hurt deeply, my self-esteem, and as a result, I've never felt like my love was enough. Eventually, I obviously figured out dolls aren't supposed to move, but still, I always wish that mine would. Sometimes I'd look at the mirror, and I'd see an old lady or man instead of my reflection. I'd walk up to go to the bathroom, and my mum would be having a full-on conversation with someone, but there was no one there. An old lady ghost in the basement was yelling at me to go upstairs because she was busy doing the wash, watching people freak out when my brother had a sleepover, then you'd never see the kids again. It was a night in particular when I was sitting on the stairs of the basement, feeling like a big grown-up kid and watching a movie with my brother and his three friends. After the movie, I went upstairs to go to bed. Before I go, get some water and go to the bathroom. When I was done, I heard my brother yelling for me. So I go down and everyone swears I came down the stairs. So it's lights out and my brother is talking to me, freaking them out. Then one kid fell asleep, and his feet happened to be in what little moonlight was shining through the little windows, and he starts moving around. So my brother and I start whispering and then stop talking and watch him. He's tossing and turning as if he's pretending to be asleep, his feet still visible in the light. He sits upright and tells my brother to stop touching his feet, and then yells at us, Whichever one of us was touching his feet had the coldest hands he's ever felt. Whilst he's saying this, his foot gets a little tickle. He stops talking and goes white and tells us that something is touching his foot. But he can see his feet and there's nothing there. He gets up to see if it's another kid playing a prank, but it isn't. So he calls his parents. And after the kid left, my brother and I are downstairs. One of the other kids says, Hey, I couldn't sleep and was watching the other guy toss and turn, and there wasn't anyone around. I know he thinks we're messing with him, but there really wasn't anyone. You guys are over there, and me and the other guy were here trying to sleep. What's up with your house, dude? None of the kids would ever return to the house again. I once asked my sister about it, and she didn't say anything, just walked away. My parents pulled me aside and told me in no uncertain terms that I should never ask her that again. I'm 40, and they haven't pulled me aside since I was in high school. I don't know what it's about, but it must be some serious PTSD levels of seriousness. My sister slept in my brother's room every night she was able. When she wasn't allowed, she'd sneak out. My brother would set her bedclothes aside and assumed she'd sleep in there. There was a little door to the attic behind my brother's dresser. We didn't use the space either. If you went inside, there was a path that went to a door to my sister's room that opened in her closet. General messes. Things turned on or worse would get turned on or off in the middle of dinner and no one would notice until it was time to eat and nothing was cooked. The first time that happened, I got in trouble for lying. It actually got to a point where I was surprised that other people didn't have ghosts in their home. Being scared was normal. Everyone went through it through childhood. I just happened to be scared all the time. We'd always see apparitions move in and out of the house. Well, I used to set up snares and trap ghosts and monsters and consume every detective novel and magazine and book 
and anything spy to help me learn what was going on. Thinking everything was normal and average, but feeling like it was all wrong. I used to watch a painting move and was randomly scared of places in my house, even though I couldn't explain. There were cold spots, things being moved, all the regular haunted house stuff. My sister even messed around with a Ouija board and made stuff worse for a while. Eventually, I would just tell the ghost either to be my friend and stick around for a while or go back to wherever it came from. And that was the last of it. I guess it really didn't want to be my friend. My wife has a background in early childhood education. After we got married, she noticed that I may have ADHD and potentially some autistic stuff going on. After a psychologist, I went for testing, a lot of it. We met with her, told her what was going on and what kind of testing we wanted. And I requested a schizophrenia test. How else am I seeing and hearing stuff no one else does? Turns out I have a few learning disabilities, which in hindsight is pretty obvious. I'd overachieve in everything but my learning disability areas. For me, it's math and language. As a result, I developed a stutter as a kid because I didn't know how to communicate things. Stuttering was my way to collect my thoughts about what I wanted to say. Aside from that, I told the doc about everything and she didn't have any answers for it. At least in the Connecticut house, I wasn't the only one. We just never talk about it, ever. I had just been watching a show that was talking about alternate realities and time travel. And it got me thinking about something that happened to me many, many years ago. I'm gonna take you back to 1967. We moved into this house in Martinez, California on Adelaide Drive. I had some weird stuff happen at this place that to this day still perplexes me. But I'll try and keep this on the subject of my blue steamer trunk that I found in the tool shed of this residence shortly after we moved in. I say my blue steamer trunk because it literally had my name on it first and last. It was taped on the top center of the trunk with the raised letters plastic label maker tape. I found it while exploring the property and wandered into the tool shed aside from the main house. I go inside and ask my mum and dad if it's something they had hid from me and would be mine soon or maybe that belonged to my auntie after whom I was named. They both said no, but suggested it could have belonged to a previous tenant as we were renting the home. So I let it go for a bit, which was odd for me because I was quite the inquisitive child and had always sought answers to all the mysteries of life. I had no idea if my name was common or not, as I was simply ten. Sometime later, I got friendly with the landlady who lived just one street over, and asked her if someone with my name had ever lived there, and explained about the trunk that should be returned to the rightful owner. But she went on to say that I was the only person with that name ever to live there, and suggested perhaps my parents were just hiding a gift for perhaps my birthday or Christmas, but I knew better. My parents were not the types to think that far ahead about gifts, and I would most likely be the recipient of a last minute gift from the grocery store or something from a thrift store or hand-me-down. I tried to put it out of my mind for a while, and it worked. Our dad and my older brother Jack had used the shed to store tools and stuff for working on the car but neither of them ever mentioned seeing this blue streamer trunk that took up a large amount of space for the relatively small shed. I remember that Jack had removed the transmission from his old car and stored it in said shed because of the minimal space. It was practically in the middle of the floor, set next to the trunk that was placed neatly under the workbench. Then one Sunday in late spring, I had a great idea for a slumber party. Remember, this was the time of the hippie protests, and things like sit-ins and even love-ins were all the rage. So I decided to have a bacon, where me and my chosen list of guests would bring their favorite cookie recipes and bake cookies for fun, entertainment, and of course, the all-important ingredients for a slumber party, snacks. All in all, it went pretty well, although my poor parents had to deal with a loud gaggling of a constant train of young girls trapezing back and forth from the patio 
and the kitchen and bathroom. Whoever thought to build a four-bedroom house with only one bathroom never had to deal with a preteen bladder. When it got late, we finished cleaning up the kitchen. Though I'm sure the patio was a lot messier, we washed our faces, brushed our teeth, and put our pyjamas on, and prepared for lights out at midnight. Of course, we rolled into our sleeping bags and pillows and such to pretend that we were going to sleep. We were so high on sugar that we had no intention of doing just that. We tried to play quietly, but if you can ever find a way to have a pillow fight quietly, I'd like to know how, because we certainly did not succeed. My older sister, who was up and sneaking talking to her boyfriend on the phone, told me that if mum got up and found her on the phone because of us, that we would regret it for the rest of our lives. As you can imagine, we decided on a quieter game. We got into a circle with me standing in the centre as the other girl sat on the floor and were trying to do what is now called light as a feather, stiff as a board. Although I wasn't lying down, I'm not sure what we chanted. It was dark except for the street light. I was watching myself in the reflection from the window and saw myself start to rise. It freaked me out, so I looked down at the other girl to see if they were seeing what was happening. Most of them had their eyes closed and were saying something like, rise in unison. It was then I noticed that Eleanor Nichols had her eyes open with her jaw gaping. She and I looked at one another and screamed. I promptly fell the six inches or so that I had been raised. Everyone had stopped their chant in fright and my mum popped through the door and yelled that we'd better shut up and go to bed right now. We tried. Well, some girls made it. But Eleanor and I were still too freaked out to sleep. I get up and ruffled through my top dresser drawer, took out a cigarette and matches I had hidden there, and motioned to Eleanor to get up as we tiptoed out the door. We peeked out to see my sister sitting there watching the door. We weren't going to leave that way. The only other way was to climb out the bedroom window and go back around to sneak a smoke. So that's exactly what we did. I took the Salem menthol cigarette, placed it to my lips and struck the match. And as I did so, I saw my little sister coming around the corner of the patio, closest to the back door. She just wanted to share the smoke. But when I said no, I was blackmailed into giving to her son because she was the baby girl and mum would believe whatever she wanted to make about me. So I passed it to Eleanor and she passed it to Sylvia, who of course got hotboxed by it, taking too many drugs. I stomped it out and thought we'd go back to my room to try to sleep. This is where things get a bit more weird. I thought we went back in the house via the front door where Sylvia came out. Deb, our big sister, wasn't in the hallway, so we got back in the room and our sleeping bags with no issues. However, I awoke just around dawn sleeping on the floor of the tool shed next to the freaking blue steamer trunk that had my name on it. Suddenly the shed door opens and it's Eleanor and my little sister. They say something like, you win hide go seek, we've been looking for you since last night after the smoke. I just laughed and went along with the idea that I'd hidden there on purpose, but I was perplexed. It's strange, but when you're a kid you can somehow let stuff you can't wrap around your head just go and proceed with whatever comes next, or maybe it was an aspect of the trunk to mask our thoughts about it. Such weirdness was a part of this time. I tell this short event to help express that many other strange and weird and even borderline outrageous things happened at the house. Not sure if it was just the trunk or the location that was the vortex of weirdness. But anyway, my brother graduated high school, joined the army and was sent off to Vietnam. Our parents started having even more issues than before when I was 12. Things were changing. I finally went into the shed and extracted the trunk. Nobody could tell me how it got there or why my name was on it but I slowly opened it. It never had a lock on it, but for some reason I never thought to open it, nor had any other member of the family. Who doesn't open something like that? It had been there for nearly three years, yet with all of my questions about it, I'd never once as much peeked inside. Let me tell you, my sisters were always going through my stuff. Anyway, this part is a bit confusing. There was a picture of a girl called Yvonne Streeter, although my sister said it was just her friend Debbie Streeter. A few years later, when incarcerated in Juvenile Hall, I met Yvonne Streeter. Yes, Debbie Streeter's little sister. Debbie and my sister Deb had been friends in school, and I had gotten that picture from Yvonne herself. There was also a picture of a cute chubby baby, 
a black nightgown, a glass water pitcher clear with yellow flowers, and some things that proved to be the objects that would astonish and amaze me. One was a paperback script of the play The Wizard of Oz. It had the initials PJ on it. There was also a library book for the script of the musical The Music Man. The card in the front said the last person to check it out was me. And the return date was July 30th, 1975. Remember I was 12 and this is 1969 when the trunk was first opened. How many years later I know how this trunk came to be. It was bought for me by my 26 year old boyfriend to help me pack up stuff while I ran away to live with him in Green River, Wyoming when I was 16. I was found, returned to California and incarcerated in Contra Costa County Juvenile Hall where they used the label maker to put my name on it. Okay, so that happens, but there's more. I was sent to foster care in Oakdale, California. My trunk was lost for a time, but eventually got sent to me in my new home. I buckled down and managed a B average on the last semester of my junior year, as well as throughout my senior year. It was quite fun there, and without my family dogging me, I did pretty well. Senior year, I had chosen to be Glenda the Good in my high school performance of The Wizard of Oz, and I had taken the nickname PJ, as my aunt, for whom I am named, had always called me Peggy, and my middle name is Jean. I later also participated in the high school musical The Music Man, though after graduation I went back to Martinez to live with my mother and stepfather. Not a great move, but it brings me to another object found in the trunk. The library book of the script of the aforementioned musical. The local summer stock was holding auditions for The Music Man. I'd already done this musical, and I thought I'd be sure to get a singing role. I went to our local library and checked out the book. I really didn't get the correlation at the time. Really, how could I have completely missed that? I just went forward and did not give the trunk that I found as a young girl a single thought. So there was the picture of the cute baby. Now years before, when I'd first opened it, my mum said that it looked like my baby brother, but it wasn't. This is who it was. And now I can write it down and deal with the weirdness. In 1977, one month before my 20th birthday, I gave birth to a 10 pound, nine and a half ounce baby boy. Me and my then husband named the baby Jason Adam Nichols. Oh, my goodness. He was the baby in the picture. That's the family resemblance to my baby brother. I still don't know how or when the trunk traveled through my own timeline, but I was the one who packed it when I moved out of our house during the separation and eventual divorce from my now ex-husband. This is just some of the weird ass stuff that happened to me. It is hard for me to even write this out and still perplexes me to this day. But I know that someday, I will hopefully completely understand. I was home alone where I am currently living with my mother, a small dog, and my two small dogs. I was in the dining area at the front of the house, talking on my cell with my stepmother and cleaning the dining room table off, which, since COVID has us both working from home, has become a home office desk. In the dining room and directly in front of this desk slash table, there are two large windows that run up the height of the wall from the ceiling to the floor. The windows look out of the front porch, followed by the garden, the front lawn, the sidewalk, and the street. If I look out into the left or south, I have a clear view of the driveway where I was always parked on the left and my mother to the right. It was about noon on this day and my mother had gone to the grocery store to pick up a few things, then for a quick stop off at a friend's house. I didn't know when she would be back, but as I was standing there chatting away, organizing my home dining office area, I stopped for a moment to gaze out the window. I was half paying attention to the conversation with my stepmother and halfway thinking about how I would like to decorate the front of the house for Christmas this year, when I saw my mother pulling up on the street heading to the driveway. I watched until she was slowing and turning in and thinking nothing of it, I walked over to the coffee pot to top up my mug. As I was pouring the coffee, I remembered that she had mentioned stopping for groceries and if she had done so, she would have wanted me to help her carry them in. So I took another look out the window to see if she appeared to have the groceries and sure enough, she was now parked in the driveway 
and out her car, standing behind her with the trunk open. And I assumed at the time it was to collect the bags and carry them in. I told my stepmom I would talk to her later and we hung up. I set my coffee down with my phone on the kitchen table and headed out the front door, which I should mention is less than 10 paces away from where I was standing. I opened the front door, walked out onto the porch and stopped dead in my tracks. There was no mother, no mother's car, no nothing. Her side of the driveway was completely empty, except a neighborhood cat. Strange, I thought. I quickly assumed that she had forgotten something at the grocery store and decided to go back to the small corner store in our neighborhood to get whatever it was. However, no sooner had I considered that possibility did I then consider that it would have been quite difficult, if not impossible, for her to have put the bags back down in the trunk, close it without me hearing it, get back in the car and back out onto the street and drive away in the small amount of time it took me for me to set my phone and mug down and walk out the front door. She would have had to have made a mad dash out of there and backing out of our driveway, unless you're looking for a collision with another vehicle, has to be done slowly as our driveway is on a rather steep incline as we live in the southern part of the USA in Louisiana, known for the heavy rains and flash flooding all year round, hence the incline. If you back out too quickly, you might get lucky and get away just as quickly, but your rear fender will not be coming with you. Secondly, my house is the last house on this side of the street that actually faces the street, which runs from north to south. The house next to us, the actual corner house, faces the street that crosses ours, running west to east, and because of that, the fence that runs the length of the backwood also runs the length of our driveway and continues almost all the way down to where the curb brings the street and driveway together. The design all but blocks the view we have of any oncoming traffic from the south. If you back out too quickly, you can easily back out in front of an oncoming vehicle that was just out of view moments earlier. Lastly, if there were an annual award handed out for slowly backing out of driveways or pulling out of parking lots, my mother would have her walls covered in plaques and trophies. I've never seen her rush out and go speeding down the street, not ever in my entire life. Considering all this, I decided I would call her to see where she had gone to and settle the matter, all the while staring and having a little chuckle with myself as I remembered those glitch in the matrix stories I had grown so fond of. I called and she answered, and when I asked why she'd left, she answered me with a bit of confusion, telling me she'd gone to a friend's house and then to the grocery store, and reminded me that she had told me as such before leaving the house earlier that day. When I told her that I had seen her come home and that I was asking about where she'd gone to then, not this morning, she had absolutely no idea what I was talking about. She said she was about 10 miles from the house still heading home and actually hadn't come home yet at all. When I told her about what I'd seen up the driveway, she told me I was freaking her out and that she'd be home soon. We hung up and I stood at the same window waiting and like clockwork, within a few minutes of ending our call, I watched her drive up the street from the same direction she had done so before, north heading south. I saw her car slow and come to an almost stop to allow her to turn in the driveway. And as I walked from the window to the front door and out the house to help with the bags, she pulled into the driveway and parked. By the time I'd made it to her parking space, she was getting out the car and this time I stood with her behind the car with the trunk open and started to collect the bags to carry in. I watched the entire scene played out just as it had done when I watched it from the window minutes before, with the only difference being I was standing outside with her watching it instead of watching from the dining office window. Everything looked exactly as it had when I watched the scene play out earlier, down to the clothes she was wearing and her mask hanging from her left ear, which is interesting to note as she rarely hung her mask off her ear, but I do remember noticing it hanging there the first time. Anyhow, we carried the bags in and life went on as usual, as it tends to. And I considered two possibilities, one being a quick but uneventful jump into and then return from the future. But had that been the case, the events would have unfolded exactly as they had before, and I would not have been standing with her behind the truck the second time. 
I would have watched her from the window just as I had the first time. And the second is a glitch in the matrix of our world. If I wasn't so familiar with these stories, I may as well have considered the possibility that I'd lost my mind. But I am familiar with them and will simply chalk it up to a glitch in reality. I feel like I'm going crazy, but I think my house might be haunted. Let me give you some background. Midwest, USA. I think it was all a wooded area a long time ago, but my great grandparents built a house. Additions were added. I think they both just died of old age, but I'm not sure. But they gave the house to my dad when he was younger, married my mum, had me and my brother, who's five years younger tore down the house that was here before and built the house that we're currently living in. That was 15 years ago. I don't know that much about my great grandparents. Great grandpa died before I was born and great grandma died before I was in school. But my parents had a rough marriage. They fought a lot. And I remember getting bad enough that I would get kicked out of the house and go next door to my aunts. They both did things to each other that were not cool. And of course, my brother and I got caught in the middle. They eventually divorced. Mom left. Dad met someone who moved in right away with her daughter. But apparently the daughter, who was two years younger than me, would try to summon demons and talk to spirits. She allegedly even tried turning the neighbor girl into a werewolf once. But that's a story for another day. Well, I was close with her mom, my dad's girlfriend. I struggled with mental illness and still do. But she helped me through a lot of it. In my freshman year of college, she ended her life within the house. A month later, Dad met someone again. They got married a year later. Two years after that, and we're in the present day. And they are in the process of getting a divorce. But now that you've got the backstory, let me get into the experiences. My first night back from my first year of college, all my crap was in my room and on my bed. So where do I sleep? In the living room on the couch? At the time I had two cats, and there was, and still is, a rocking chair that the ex-girlfriend would occasionally sit and rock in. Well, I was laying on the couch trying to sleep. One cat would be sleeping on my chest, and the other would sleep on the floor next to me. Then I heard the chair start creaking like someone and it was rocking. I didn't feel threatened or anything, but I felt spooked the hell out and thought I was going crazy. I've been home for almost two months now since I graduated college. Dad and his wife were fighting and she left about three weeks ago. After she left, I noticed something happen. We have a two-story house. When I would be downstairs alone, a chandelier above the table would have a light that would flicker off when I wasn't looking, but come back on when I would look at it. Sometimes I would turn my head fast enough to catch it coming back on, and this happened several times. I didn't have to be home alone for it to happen, but I had to be the only person downstairs. My house also just felt off. I don't know how to describe it, but I always got these bad vibes. Even my fiance feels it and notices it when she's over. It just doesn't feel like home. This next part isn't my experience, but apparently things would be moved around in a manner that my great granddad, my dad's grandma, would move things in a way only she would. The ex felt that the house was haunted two years ago. She and I had a conversation about it, and that's how I heard about the things being moved. So I think back to the problem. Reflecting on it, I think the problem was that my parents fought a lot. It was bad, malicious, a lot of resentment, but they tried staying together for the kids, which didn't work out well. I've struggled with depression since I was a child, and I've had lots of dark and morbid thoughts. Dad and his ex fought a lot too. Dad and his soon-to-be ex-wife fight a lot. The house just feels like a void of maliciousness, anger and resentment a black hole that sucks out all things positive. Maybe something has caused this. Perhaps it was already here and we've only made it worse. 
I think the shenanigans the daughter did, certainly, didn't make matters any better. As for the light, as of now I can't think of anything besides the bad bulb that was somehow in sync with me, but I don't think anyone's changed it. What can I do? Do I have any options? I don't know where to go, where to start. All replies are welcome and appreciated. Oh, and I just remembered. The other neighbor's kid, the neighborhood kids aren't the right term as they live out in the middle of nowhere, but that's the closest thing I can call them, had several experiences with the ditch that runs on my family's property, but on the opposite side of the road. On our side, my aunt had a friend that was a medium. A long time ago, she said she saw something on her side of the ditch that runs between my and her house, and it was described as my great-grandpa digging roughly where there's a big rut that will mess you up on an ATV if you're driving on that back road. I don't know if the friend is still in the area. I think she moved. Nonetheless, all of these things really do scare me. I've experienced weird occurrences that seem like glitches. The first one happened when I was about 10 in 2014. My mum took me and my brother to get some new clothes. My brother and I picked some clothes and each a pair of pajamas. We took the bag with all the clothes in it and put it in my room. Late that night, I went to take out my clothes and put them away, but my pajamas were different, but the same size and brand, just a different pattern. This confused the hell out of all of us. This was extremely weird, but life went on. Fast forward to 2017 to my second experience. I was around 13 and I had to walk my dogs. One of them doesn't require a leash and he just follows me. I walked to the backyard of my apartment building and the backyard was around 100 meters long. My dog ran around 40 yards down the yard so I kept my eyes on him with my other dog on a leash. I saw my dog stop at a bush to pee and when he was finished, he looked back at me and then continued to walk forward until he just faded away and disappeared. And I couldn't believe it. Not two seconds after I saw him fade away, he was sitting behind me. And all of this happened within about seven seconds. I know there's no possible way he could have run 40 yards right to me and sat behind me without me seeing it. That same summer, I was staying at my dad's house and I realized I left my headphones at my house. I found a pair of white Sony earbuds in a drawer and figured I'd use those. Two days later as I was leaving, I left those white ones in my desk drawer so I'd have a pair at my dad's house. The next weekend, my mum was doing laundry. When she called me in, she said, stop leaving your earbuds in your pocket. I'm not buying you anymore. She pulled out the ones I knew I left at my dad's and I even said that but figured it was possible I'd accidentally brought them home. But the pair of pants she found them in were jeans, and the weekend I was at my dad's I had sweatpants. This had me very confused, but I didn't think much of it after. I took those headphones and put them on my desk at my house. The weekend after I went back to my dad's, and this time I brought my Beat Solo 3 headphones and left the white ones back home. I got to my dad's, opened my drawer, and there they were the white Sony earbuds, the same ones I'd just seen at my house 45 minutes ago. It was like all of a sudden I had two pairs and they were identical, down to the faded white color rubber wire with the same stains about an inch down from the left speaker. And it had me dumbfounded. I left those in the drawer and didn't use them. And then when I went home again, the duplicated pair was still on my desk. I used them for a bit, but sometime during the whole week, those headphones vanished and I hadn't realized for a while, and everyone in my house was certain that they didn't take them, and were convinced I'd left them at my dad's. I walked into my room, opened my drawer, and they were gone as well. No one had been in my room either, so I have no idea what happened and where those earbuds went. I'm still confused to this day. In December 2018, I got a brand new airsoft pistol, so I went to my friend's house, and we planned on shooting targets from his back deck. One of the magazines to my pistol I had lost. I had two of them and one of them was gone. We had only walked about 20 square feet of his back deck and we searched every inch of it, but couldn't find the mag. 
and I was annoyed, but figured I'd buy a new one. The next day, we went back outside to continue shooting the airsoft guns, and my friend found my missing mag on the complete other side of the yard. We hadn't even been in that one, or remotely close to it. This again confused me. Six months later in June, my friend and I were on the phone making plans to hang out later that night, when I told him I had to go feed my dogs, which took about three minutes. I got back to the phone when my friend asked me if I was okay, and I said yes, and asked what he meant. According to him, he heard static, and he heard me talking, but it wasn't me per se. It sounded like an older version of me, much deeper. I looked at my phone, and it said we'd been on the phone for nine minutes, and his said 18. I remembered it was around 6.30, but time went by faster, and I was only gone for three minutes, but my friend said it was way longer. This was my last glitch, and I hope I don't have any more. I had a strange experience when I was growing up. I was around 12 and coming up from the basement. I was walking up the first few steps when I turned to my left and see a tall woman the size of the door walking through the basement hallway. She was super thin and literally the size of the door and almost translucent. You can bet I hauled ass up the stairs and didn't go down for literal months and never returned down there by myself again. Then there was the time I was sitting in my bed around 17 or 18. I couldn't sleep and was watching some movies on my laptop. My closet door swung open didn't sway or anything, just quickly swung wide open and stopped immediately before hitting the wall. I threw my covers over my face and froze in fear until the morning, and couldn't sleep a wink, it was that traumatic. Then there was the white dog everyone in my family saw at least once running around on the main floor. As far as I knew, the dog was chill. Then there was the baby story. My niece was two. We, my family and I, were sitting in the living room and all of a sudden she gets a very serious look on her face and stares at the corner of the room where no one is and says, Baby! She immediately makes a beeline into the corner of the room with a big smile on her face. Then the smile falls and she stops in her tracks and says, Where baby go? We all look at each other in disbelief and still talk about it to this day. That kid is also super connected to death. She used to remember how she died. My dad was watching Hindenburg footage on a documentary, and she saw it and said, That's how I died. There was so much fire. She was three or four, and then wouldn't answer any more about it. But back to the house. You could always hear doors slamming in the basement if you were quiet in the mornings. One morning, just my dad and I were home, and he said, you ever just sit here and hear the doors slam downstairs? So we sat up and listened, and before long we heard one slam. Lastly, my whole family went on vacation one summer, but I stayed because I had to work. I was in the living room watching TV as I refused to sleep upstairs alone. Must have been around 2 a.m., and I hear the shower turn on. I'm crapping myself as I'm walking very slowly to the bottom of the step to see if I'm hearing it right. Then all of a sudden I hear the shower handle squeak and turn off. And then I ran out of that place so fast and stayed with friends until my family returned. It took me about a week to move out into my own place after they returned. It was starting to mess with me mentally. I know the house was haunted. Also, the neighbors that moved in after us, their kid got incredibly sick about a month after moving into the house. The house had passed inspection with flying colors before selling, no mold anywhere, but now there was black mold all of a sudden, and it put the kid in the hospital for days. I mean, I'm not saying the house tried to kill the kid, but I'm not saying that it didn't.